Okay, so we're, uh, we're coming in on, on time to begin. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. One is at, uh, well, in one minute, the, um, the uh, online evaluation form should go live for the uh, students in the class. Please use that evaluation. Refer to the email I sent last night that has details on how to do that. And remember to save your answers because it's really important. Um, members of the Industry Advisory Board, you guys should have had uh, the fillable PDFs emailed to you by John Gord. Uh, please use those to, uh, to rate the presentations. That would be appreciated. Okay, so um, I guess I should say officially welcome to um, the uh, Computer Science Section 1 um, um, room on, uh, on, on Moodle as part of the Senior Design Conference. Uh, the format for this is I'll do a brief introduction. I'll then uh, hand the presentation off to uh, the, the lead presenter. The lead presenter is just the person who's coordinating. They're, they're not necessarily the team lead or anything like that. But I'll hand it off to them and they will speak for about 20 minutes. Questions are from the audience are encouraged. The way that will work is you just type your question into chat. And when we get to the, towards the end of the presentation and there's about 10 minutes left, um, I, as moderator, will, will read your questions to the team. And with that, uh, let me introduce team one. This is Project Meal Planner, and uh, the uh, team is called Abracadata. So take it away, Abracadata. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. We are, as like you just said, we are team Abracadata. And um, Daryl, if you want to introduce yourself. Hey, Daryl DeRusso. Hi. I'm uh, Clay Fonseca, and I did a lot of the backend and database work for this project. Hi, my name is Coleman Levy. I worked on the front end for this project. Hi, my name is Kyle Morales, and I worked on hosting and security as well as testing. Uh, I did more of a DevOps role in the project. And my name is Brad Reno, and I took a algorithm design and system architecture role for this project. And so now I will start sharing my screen. And we can get started. So as you can see, this is our senior design project and uh, let's go ahead. All right, so the general idea for this project is that Project Meal Planner is a website meant to help users with planning out their weekly meals. This is done by allowing users to input an optimal amount of calories and nutrients. And then the website generates a week's worth of meals, three meals a day from those input nutritional values. Okay. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the container architecture of our project. So what we decided to go with was rather than a traditional lamp, lamp stack for a web app, we went with a microservice architecture model. And so what that means is that every single aspect of our project, every single um, segment of it is in its own Docker container. So let me walk you through uh, our basic architecture and we're gonna get into this uh, into each section later. So first we have an Nginx reverse proxy that simply just forwards the requests that users send if they are requesting something in port 80 when they want web content that will simply just forward them to our next, which is the next, it is a Node.js container that compiles our React code um, using uh, next.js. And then if somebody is sending a request to our backend APIs, it will then forward it to our Node.js express container. And so as you can see below the backend uh, box, you can see a Flask API. That is what we use for our meal plan generator. And so simply put, when somebody requests for a meal plan to be generated, it forwards that request to the Flask API, and then the generation happens, and then the meal plan is then sent to the MySQL database. So let's talk about the databases that we have here. So we're using both MongoDB and MySQL. And uh, the MongoDB is what we're using to store our recipes, as we determined that a document style database would be more effective for storing a recipe that could have a variable number of ingredients or steps, so on and so forth. And then the MySQL table is storing the, uh, the individual meal plans for each associated user because it's easier to store that as a row rather than as a document. So if you can see in the, in the bottom portion here, we have two, uh, two containers that are in red. Um, these are two of the containers that we removed when we moved to our production deployment. We removed both the database wrapper and the C advisor container. The uh, database wrapper was simply just a way for us to use a web interface to look at our MongoDB data to make sure everything was being manipulated and inserted properly. And once we were done with those tests, we're able to remove that container. 
And then C Advisor is the profiler that we're using for the first couple of sprints. And then as we move to deployment on DigitalOcean, we were able to scrap that container because DigitalOcean performed much of the roles that we needed from the C Advisor container. So let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening with our front end. So like Brad said, we used uh, React and Next.js to do the compilation of the website. We used Material UI as, for getting components for the website. And as to why we use Next instead of Create React, React App, Next was uses server-side rendering, which is much more inexpensive than trying to render cl client-side. Basically, the server renders the page and sends the page to the client instead of client rendering every time. So we chose Next out of the two. React we chose because it has a, a lower learning curve and is easier because some of our group members were new to working with websites. As for the design of the website, we used extensive UX testing to figure out what the users would want from a meal planning website. Now, as for the design of the two most important pages, we have our week view page and our edit requirements page. Week view page is laid out in this way so it's easy for users to tell which meal they are clicking on and which meal they're getting for the day. And it comes in this card format. So there are 21 total buttons for the three meals a day, seven days a week. As for edit requirements page, we went for a very simplistic design with just text boxes indicating which nutrients you're supposed to be putting in and where you should put your username so that users will not get confused at all using the website. And you'll see these pages in more detail when we move on to our demo later. All right, so our primary backend container uses a RESTful API written with Node.js and Express. Uh, the meal plan generation itself is handled with the Flask API. You'll hear more about that in a few minutes. But uh, as for our primary backend container, it supports the communication between the databases and the Flask API and the front end. So there are routes there for uh, pulling meal data to the Flask API and then from the MongoDB and then storing meal plans into the SQL database from the Flask API as they're generated. Uh, additionally, it also supports querying meal data from the front end so it can load the recipes properly there. And it just does those by ID where the Flask requests do it by tag and nutritional information. Uh, it just uh, governs our whole internal interaction there. Okay. All right, so for the data collection, we got all of our recipes from allrecipes.com which is just a website where you can find how to make a lot of meals for our current data set. We have about 50 breakfast recipes and around 100 lunch and dinner recipes. So um, if you look at the bottom, we have a screenshot from our database. Uh, we gave the ID so we can identify it. We gave it a URL so when you click on it, you can, it goes to that exact recipe. He gave it a title so you can recognize the um, ingredients on how to make the recipes. Um, instructions on how to also make the recipes. Uh, we then put nutrition values like your sodium intake and calories and also a tag for another identifier. And also uh, one of our stretch goals was to make the database kind of for a wider user base, but we didn't get to it. We wanted to put in vegan, vegetarian, and keto meals just for more users. Okay. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about who, how we actually generate meal plans. So our actual meal plan generator is fairly simple. It just uses a depth first heuristic search. And so if you look on the right hand side, you can see a uh, mock-up graph that Coleman had created for me. This is basically whenever somebody submits a request for a meal plan to be generated, a graph that looks very similar to this is generated. And then we then search that graph to find a meal plan that is within a certain percentage of what they want. And we'll get into that in just a second. And so the heuristic value in the depth first heuristic search is calculated using the nutritional value divided by the desired amount. The score is then weighted based off of a weight that we, we had come up with after extensive testing and really asking people, what do you think is the most important out of your meal plans? Do you prefer that your calorie needs are met? Do you prefer if your protein needs are met? So on and so forth. And so the weights that we had actually determined for the heuristic were uh, calories at 0.4, fat at 0.1, cholesterol at 0.05, sodium at 0.15, carbohydrates at 0.1, protein and 0.2. And what this basically means is that when they're all added up, you're gonna get a weight of 100. And um, the ideal heuristic value would be a perfect 100 score because that indicates that you're meeting 100% of your desired nutritional amounts, but you are not going above or below that. 
And so you can actually see an example of that in the bottom right hand side. Um, the first line is the raw information about the nutritional statistics of the meal plan. And then you have the heuristic value that is the uh, value that's been returned from our, my heuristic algorithm. And it is 102%. So what that means is that the meal plan that has been generated is a little bit more than what the user wanted, but it is within the, the golden range that I determined of like plus or minus 5% of their desired amount. And uh, so we determined that that was enough because it is a, it's very difficult for us to get within plus or minus 1% of what somebody wants. And so we determined that a 10% range was close enough that gave people a meal plan with what they wanted. And then simply put in the bottom line is just the, uh, the meal IDs for that meal plan. Okay. Now let's talk about our databases. So first off, we use two separate databases, one with Mongo and one with SQL, because they each have their own advantages and disadvantages for our, uh, specific uses. Uh, specifically, our uh, Mongo database was used for storing our recipes because it's it was very simple to import our number of like 150 recipes into the database itself by just converting them to JSON. And additionally, it allows for uh, flexibility in the size of documents. So it really helped us with storing uh, recipes with different numbers of steps and ingredients. Then our SQL database we use for storing our meal plans. You can he see a test one of those at the bottom here. Uh, since a meal plan covers a week and there's a fixed number of meals for that week, it was fairly simple to just set it up so that every meal plan is a row in a single table with an identifier followed by 21 different numerical meal IDs, which are used to pull that meal's information from the Mongo database when populating the front end. Okay. All right, so I'll talk about how we utilize profilers to help improve our, our app. Um, so for in terms of the profilers that we use to help our, uh, help our, our project uh, in terms of optimization of our algorithms. Um, the first one was uh, the one that Brad had mentioned earlier during the uh, container architecture slide. Uh, it's the C advisor container. This is basically a separate Docker container that its sole purpose is to monitor the resource usage of all the other containers. Um, so what's really good about this is that it also actually gave the resource usage for each executable within each container. So not only could we see the re overall resource usage for the container, but we could also zoom in and see what, exactly where all the resources are being taken up. Uh, the main application of this was an optimization of the data mining algorithm, uh, Brad, Brad's Flask API. Um, the reason that, why that's so important is because um, if, the, if the run times for that are too long, it adversely affects user experience. So it's very important that we keep that in check because usually speaking, data mining algorithms are very, excuse me, they're very complex in terms of uh, dimensionality uh, for their algorithms. Um, however, like he said, we eventually stripped away the C advisor container whenever it came to actually deploying our project because it was unnecessary. Because thankfully our cloud hosting DigitalOcean uh, gives a, a profiler that we can use to monitor our resource usage while the app is hosted on the cloud. And um, you know, we, we, we use that after we deployed it to ensure that our app is performing as expected once the containers were stripped. So now we'll move into our hosting and security. Uh, like I said, uh, we have our website hosted through a DigitalOcean droplet. Uh, the reason why we went to, with DigitalOcean is because it offers an affordable hosting plan that's within our resource requirements. Um, and the fact that it gives us profi a pro profiler ability through uh, whenever it's hosted on the cloud is great. Um, as for security, um, any routes that were not directly used for core functionality of the project were stripped. Um, this is talking about basically a bunch of backend routes as well as uh, database queries and so on and so forth, uh, stripping these routes uh, it was very necessary to make that more secure. It's less things that could potentially be exploited. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that even though we eventually abandoned user accounts in favor of just having a simple meal ID that people can pull up, um, we had early on uh, implementations of configuring bcrypt to properly hold, uh, hash and salt user passwords. Um, even though, like I said, the accounts were, user accounts were eventually abandoned due to uh, time constraints, um, it shows that we had security in mind from the very beginning of the project. and um, that, that we just continually continue to de develop with security in mind. All right, let's move into the testing. So we use two main types of testing. We use the third integration testing a little bit, but I'll talk about the two main types that we used. Um, the first one is unit testing. Um, 
as you know, unit tests are tests that test each individual components of a project. Uh, we actually uh, created an entire test suite uh, on a container, our backend test underscore one container, um, and it provides a re it provides a report on basically all of the tests and whether or not they passed or failed, as you can see in the screenshot on the right hand side. Um, as for UX testing, our other main uh, type of testing, uh, due to COVID nineteen, you know, we all have our limitations that we hit whenever it came to that. Um, however, we still were able to get really good, really valuable user feedback. We basically showed roommates and family members and so on and so forth. Um, our app posted locally, basically, we just like gave them our computer and said, hey, what do you guys think about this? How could we improve this? And that was really what we used to help give us that valuable user feedback to help improve our layout, our design and, and improve the usability of the project. All right, now let's move on to the demo. All right, so we are gonna go to our website. And so as you can see here, our project is hosted at projectmealplanner.com. And so this is the first thing that you see whenever you navigate to the website. You can see uh, the edit requirements page and the week view page. So first, let's go ahead and generate a website. I mean, uh, generate a uh, meal plan, my bad. So we are gonna first start with entering our user ID that we desire. So for this case, I'm just gonna use Capstone. Um, I will get into why I just put that value there in just a second. Okay, so when we were trying to make sure that people wouldn't submit invalid um, information into our forms, we had actually set it so that these forms will not submit unless there are valid values that are in these blanks. And so if somebody were to put anything that is not allowed, for example, if somebody were to put a letter or strange character in any of these blanks, then um, the form would not submit. So simply by removing that, we can go here and just hit submit. It will take us back to the home page, and then we can go ahead and look at our meal plan. So we'll just simply come here. We'll enter our user ID that we uh, came up with when we generated our meal plan. Okay. Now we will look at our week view. Okay, so upon hitting the submit button, it calls to the API, and that's how the meals get generated into these cards. As you can see, we have the 21 cards you mentioned earlier. They're clearly labeled. And if you click on one of them, let's say Monday breakfast, you can see it pulls up this screen where basically, oh, by the way, this doesn't generate a new web page. This is on the same web page as well. So this shows the card that explains the food that is for Monday breakfast. As you can see here, we have Cajun style eggs Benedict. It, like it, like Daryl mentioned with the uh, data, you can see the food title, the nutrition, the amount of servings, the ingredients, the recipe, AKA the instructions, and then the source where we got this from was all recipes. And each one of these cards will have a different recipe in them. And so as you can see, you can come here and you're gonna, for the most part, get 21 unique recipes that have come from our data set. And each three combinations of recipes should give you plus or minus 5% of what you want for your daily uh, nutrition allotment. And so, Let's talk about uh, some of the bugs that we've encountered when we are talking about this website, because I'm sure some of you have navigated to the website now that I've given you the domain name. And um, one thing that happened when we transitioned our production environment to the cloud was that the first time when loading in the web page, occasionally what will happen is the UI elements will not load, right? And so that is simply fixed by navigating to a different page and navigating back to the home page. We were not able to determine what actually caused this issue. But if I were to switch to our, our local deployment of this, um, exact same code, exact same everything, um, this issue would not be present. And so we weren't able to actually determine what caused this. And so to finish off our demo, we're gonna show you our uh, nice logo that, our, our, uh, that Coleman created for us. And uh, that's about it for the demo. Okay. All right, so for our Trello, um, Across our sprints, we got a lot done. We got around 9% of all of our tasks done that we wanted to get done. Um, during sprint one and two, it was when we were first going into the sprints, researching, um, getting what we wanted to do for the website together. Um, and that reflects by the percentages. Uh, sprint three is when the quarantine happened and we were getting used to things. Um, our tasks really went a little bit slower. And during sprint four and five is when we got used to the quarantine and we were just pushing out um, tasks, pushing out plans to do what we wanted to do with the website before the deadline. Okay. And so this is our GitHub page. And so as you can see right here, you can see the overall commit flow that we had throughout our project. And then on the right-hand side, you can see our individual commits. 
and um, really not a whole lot to show there, but let's get on to the lessons learned. And so for this, we decided that every single person on our team needed to come up with one lesson that they're going to take away from this project into future endeavors. Kyle, if you want to start. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll start off with mine. Um, the biggest one is something I kind of talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, we should have spent significantly less time on stretch goals during earlier sprints. So what I have in mind, whatever I'm saying this is I was talking about how we eventually abandoned user accounts. Um, a lot of the work that I did personally earlier on was uh, setting up the back end so that we could properly handle uh, the, uh, the, it could properly handle user information and, you know, deal with security in regards to that. Um, but it turned out by the time we hit sprint four or five, we had actually just dropped user accounts. So a lot of the work that I did back then um, didn't really come to fruition. So we should have really fully realized whether or not we could have actually gotten the user accounts done and uh, allocated our resources accordingly in earlier sprints. Okay. So now we, uh, for my lesson learned, we should have deployed our website earlier because when we had done that, it allowed us to find many bugs and errors that we had not, not no we had not noticed before. For example, I had sent the link to a family member of mine and in the course of about 40 second phone call, she had broken our website about three times. So there was a whole lot that we hadn't noticed about our functionality that we needed to fix. And by going to an outside source, we were able to quickly find those errors and patch them. All right, so with my lesson learned, um, I feel like I should have spent more time researching the languages um, that goes with websites. Because when I was trying to do form submissions, send um, your data to our backend, when you click submit. Uh, I had a hard time figuring out one thing and I kind of redid it like five or six times, broke a few things and it was just really stressful. So I just wish around like the earlier sprints, I researched more with the languages. All right, for my lesson learned, I, uh, I learned that I should scan my work for simple mistakes before committing. Uh, I actually ran into this a few times when I was working on the API routes for the Flask API, or for, for our main backend API to interact with the Flask API, where, say, for the search, where it searches by tag and nutritional information, it can do, it can do that search without the nutritional information. And so that's an if case in the backend. And I fixed an error I was running into for one side of the if case, but not for the other. And uh, when Brad went to go use that, it gave an error. And at the time, he didn't have internet. So I, we, we had to troubleshoot that. And I had to send him the information on how to fix that through text. And so for my lesson learned, I need to have a better understanding of how our front end component system works. We use Material UI. And due to me being new to the tech component system, I had to struggle with it for a couple of hours on multiple issues when it comes to styling just to make the components look and act correctly. Okay, so let's move on. Any questions? So uh, thanks guys, I appreciate um, your presentation. And yes, we do have a number of questions um, from, uh, from the audience. The first question is, uh, what advantages did you gain by not using the traditional lamps and instead using what you did? Um, can, can you repeat that? I believe your, your connection is, is going out, uh, Dr. O'Neill. He's frozen. Uh, yes. Um, I guess. Uh, I think I heard most of the question. It was basically, what did we gain from using uh, the uh, web, web framework that we did rather than using the traditional LAMP stack? Okay. Um, let me try and answer that. So, okay. So originally we had thought about going with the LAMP stack. However, we wanted to stick as close as possible to what is considered uh, closer to industry standard. And so as we were doing our research, we determined that a lot of people have moved to using the microservice architecture model rather than just your simple uh, lamp, uh, lamp stack. And so that's why we decided to go ahead and try this. And from what we've learned so far about it, um, it's, it's significantly more efficient. And uh, I'm, I am happy that we decided to go with that. We, we did save a lot of uh, time and development resources uh, going with that. Any other questions? Actually, I'd like to add on the very end of that. Um, like the initial learning curve was a lot higher than it probably would have been with the LAMP stack, but once we got used to it, things moved a lot smoothly, a lot more smoothly in like the later sprints. Yes. 
one significant advantage of us using uh, Docker containers, I suppose, was that we didn't really ever have to worry about making sure everybody had all the libraries installed and everything was configured properly. You, you set up Docker and then you, uh, you just ran those containers and everything just worked. It was, it was a dream because uh, we, we had had a lot of issues at the, the, at the very beginning of our project with everybody trying to set up their development environments. And um, so, yeah. Any other questions, Dr. O'Neill? Seems like Dr. O'Neill's back. Yes. So, so we have some more questions from the audience. So one of them is, uh, many people use non-traditional meal schedules for a variety of health reasons. Or they like to allocate calories to breakfast, lunch, and then protein for dinner, or maybe even have five smaller meals each day. How would you change your app to handle this? Um, if we were to change our app to handle this, um, the simply put, we would have to expand on our data set because our entire project is based off of the data that we've collected. For example, if we wanted to accommodate people with specific diets, like vegan, vegetarian, and so on and so forth, all that would entail is simply gathering that data and then um, having our front end and our algorithm accommodate people who wanted those specific dietary needs. And so it would be a simple, it would be a simple data problem for the most part. The, uh, the dev resources for the other aspects of the project would be almost negligent. Uh, if I could add on, do, for front end, I would add on uh, a possible optional advanced settings section for the edit requirements page so that you can go into more detail about where this data should be going for our web page generation. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, so thank you. Brad, I would ask that you stop sharing your screen so people can see the smiling faces of the people who are responding. Sure, thank thanks. you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, another question, uh, you mentioned using Mongo to store recipes because of uh, uh, variable steps and ingredients. Did you consider using a relational database uh, to implement this? Uh, we thought about it, but uh, as I hadn't used Mongo before, we decided to go forward with Mongo because why not take the opportunity to use learn a new technology? Yes. Okay, that sounds good. There's another question here. Uh, you guys integrated a number of systems to build this system. How much time was spent on learning curves for each of these systems instead of on pure development? Um, a significant portion of our project was spent on just getting adjusted to what um, to all the new technologies and systems that we were using, but we determined that the whole point of our capstone project was to learn technologies and techniques that will then carry us into the future for whatever career path we want to go on. And so we determined that the more we could learn doing this project, the better off we would be. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. We do have one more question. This question uh, says that, uh, or asks, were the weights in the generator based on nutritional needs that may change based on nutrition goals, such as weight loss or reduced sodium? Okay, so for the, the heuristic values, the heuristic weight, sorry, um, that was something that we had determined after asking it, numerous people, like, what do you find most important? For, um, for your caloric needs. For example, if you want to really make sure that your, your protein needs are met or your calorie needs are met, where would you rate this? And so we had determined that that's how we had determined the weights. In future works, if we had wanted to, it would be very simple for us to allow people to simply indicate what they would prefer. So for example, if they don't care that their calorie needs are met, but they wanna only have 1200 milligrams of sodium every single day, well then we could accommodate for that very easily. It'd be a simple matter of just changing weight values. Any other uh, awesome. So thank you guys. I think I made it through everyone's question. Um, would everybody give a big round of reaction applause to, uh, <laughs> uh, to team um, uh, Abracadata with their project meal planner? Th thank you guys. We appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, there are, um, I've had a few people tell me that they were having trouble sending me a PM in the chat session. Um, believe it or not, my Zoom has already crashed twice <laughs> while, we've been, while we've been going through. But uh, thankfully the room is set so that if I, if I disappear, the, the conference continues without me. Um, but that may be the reason is some of you who joined very early um, 
that may that may be the reason if you messaged me uh, right at the beginning and I've dropped out since that might be a problem if you're trying to send me a question uh, and 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 you don't have my my text number like some of you have <laughs> uh, then um, what you need to do is raise your hand and if I send you a message then uh, you will be able uh, you have any more trouble communicating with me after that. So um, if you are having problems getting messages to me, uh, if you raise your hand, just, and if, you, if I don't respond, keep it because obviously I'm bouncing between a lot of things, but, uh, but that's, how we will, that's how we will handle that. Mm -hmm. And with that said, uh, we should be coming up on um, 1.30. So we have the presentation by Box Crew, and yes, Crew is spelled C-R-E-W-E. -E. Uh, Box is a professor at Tech, and these were some students who had taken one of his classes, and that's where the name Box Crew comes from. Their project is Lunchpad, not Launchpad, but Lunchpad, and um, you guys take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacob Sennett. I'm going to be in charge of running the slides for this presentation, and uh, during the course of this project, I mainly focused on the security aspects, uh, system administration tasks, and a lot of database work. Hello, I'm Kimi Atienza. I'm mostly focused on front end, algorithm to front end. Hello, I'm Bradford Doty, and the main tasks that I do were helping with the front end for the mobile website, uh, helped a little with the algorithm and connecting the algorithm to our database. Hey everybody, my name is Stella Lee. I worked mostly on the mobile front end and as well as the database. My name is Caleb Snook. I did a lot of work on the algorithm as well as API calling for this project. And my name is John Walls. I worked on a lot of the front end as well as front end to database connections. Uh, so Jacob, if you want to go ahead and uh, share the slideshow, I'll go ahead and start talk about the overview of what Lunchpad is. Uh, basically, Lunchpad is a web-based application uh, we have a website up, lunchpad.app, that anybody can go to to use our web app. Basically, it's a web-based application that allows a group of people to decide on where they want to eat if maybe that group is indecisive on where they'd like to go. Um, from a group of people, there can be uh, one, one person in that group can start a room basically by entering a room code that they come up with, and then the other members in the group can join that same room uh, by entering the same room code. It's kind of similar to uh, Jackbox games, if any of you guys are familiar with uh, how they do their uh, room system. As people join a room, they can basically rate different categories of food on a scale of one to five. Uh, these categories are things like American or Chinese or uh, Italian food, like that kind of thing. Um, in addition to rating them on one to five, they can also mark a certain food as an allergy. And that just basically assumes that we won't suggest a, uh, a restaurant to the group that somebody in the group might be allergic to. Uh, once everybody has submitted their uh, preferences, they will be displayed as ready to the host, and the host can then uh, essentially ready up and tell our backend algorithm that, hey, all these preferences are good to go. Uh, those preferences will be sent to the backend algorithm. They'll be compiled and will basically uh, kind of have a general understanding of the categories that the group like are interested in common. And from there, we'll use Google API calls to pull a series of restaurants that kind of fit into those categories. And then once we have one restaurant decided, we'll send it back to the host and the other members of the group, at which point they'll either decide that they do want to eat there or they don't want to eat there, in which case they can always re-roll and we will uh, suggest another restaurant from the algorithm we've already ran. Kind of why we decided to do this project is because we know it's a problem a lot of groups face, including ourselves. Uh, you may be in situations where like us specifically, like it's after class or something and you can't decide where you want to eat and the group just can't come to a decision on their own. Uh, or like a similar situation where maybe you want to go out and eat lunch with your coworkers or something, but you guys just can't come to a consensus. So we just kind of wanted to alleviate that issue. So that's kind of our background on why we decided to do this. And that's kind of the problem we're attempting to solve with Lunchpad here. So we'll go ahead and move on. So for the team member roles, we first decided to split the team up into three teams of two, where two people will be working on the database, two people will be working on the front end, and two people will be working on the algorithm. Once we got the basics of that done, we decided to combine the groups. Therefore, the database could be connected to front end, front end could be connected to algorithm, and so forth. Individually, Kimmy, she worked on the web page and as well as mobile development for the front end. She also worked on applying the algorithm done to the front end. Bradford, he worked on the algorithm. He worked on connecting the algorithm to the database and as well as the mobile front end. 
Stella, which is me, I worked on the mobile front end and as well as setting up the database in MySQL. Jacob, he worked on security, which is like securing the website. He worked on setting up the database in MySQL. And as well, he was the system administrator. So therefore, he was the one that was installing the packets that packages that we needed in order to run the code. Caleb, he worked on the Google API calls and as well as algorithm development. John, he worked on the front end, the web page front end, and as well, he worked on the database to front end connections with Ajax calls. Okay, now we'll be going over the methodologies and tools that we used uh, for our entire project. So for the methodology, we used the Agile method. So we had five sprints that lasted two weeks each, and that was the uh, entirety of our project. And for our organization, we used Trello just to keep track of tasks and know who was supposed to be doing what. We used GitHub just as a repository for all of our code. And for the last part of organization, we use Git as a way of keeping track of the uh, last person who submitted something or if there was uh, something wrong with it, we could go back and check. So basically just version control. Then for communication, we mainly communicated through Discord and Zoom. Uh, they were very nice just because we had screen share, we could look at each other and it was very easier to do since we couldn't meet each other physically. For more detailed uh, aspects for our automated testing, we use Cucumber for a user test. So just a quick uh, overview. For Cucumber, we created scripts that for our website would simulate typing in information for the, uh, for the website. And whenever we ran it, it would basically try to see if there was any problems with our code or if there was any problems with our website, and just pretending to be a user. And then finally, we used Jest. And Jest is just a uh, JavaScript uh, testing framework. And whenever we used that, it was for unit testing. Now, that was to check to make sure our algorithm that we were trying to use to decide which restaurants to pick was great was uh, doing the correct edge cases. So it's very nice because we could change out numbers, we could change out values, and we could see if all of our edge cases were being correctly displayed. Uh, finally, we're going to be talking about technical tools. So for our profiler, we decided to use Java Chrome's JavaScript profiler. This was nice because we could pull it up whenever we were testing the website and we could find any issues that we were having with it. And then for the uh, Ajax calling, we just use that to communicate from our uh, HTML page to our PHP code. Then for SQL, we just used it to generate queries for, from our database to and from it. Then HTML and CSS we used for generating our web pages and just to format for both the mobile and the desktop versions. Then for PHP and JavaScript, we use those as a way to communicate between our different files just, you know, if we wanted to access the database or if we wanted to access the front end, we just use both of those. And then finally for Google's API and JSON, Google's API was used to capture the restaurants and then JSON was used to capture the, uh, bring back the restaurants back to us in a more clean suited way. And then now to the next slide. So if you look in the very top left corner, I'm gonna be going through our flowchart of how our website works uh, front end to back end. Now on the very top left, you can see we have our web front end. That's what every user sees. And then if you go on the right hand side, you can see where it says it goes to name and preferences. And that goes, is saved to our database when a user submits their name and preference. Then that algorithm, uh, then uh, our database goes to our preferences, which is passed through our decision algorithm, which is kind of lightly what I was talking about earlier. Then once the decision is made, it chooses certain restaurants and passes those categories for the style of restaurants, such as like Mexican or uh, Chinese or any other type of food is passed to our, and a Google API is called. So once the restaurants are passed through, it goes through what we're calling our anti-repetition engine, which is just a way for us to make sure that if someone doesn't like their suggestion, there is a way to go back and get another suggestion without making an entirely new Google API call. Found that suggestions pass and saved to our database and then it is displayed back to our user where they can decide what to do with it. Okay, so a little bit about our servers and website. So our website was written in HTML with JavaScript, CSS, Ajax, and PHP. This allowed the database to connect back to the front end with these types of scripts. And then our database was accessed via SQL commands within our PHP code on the front end. 
Also, we use a lot of cookies in local storages to save local variables on our front end. So this allows us with local storage to accept user's name and keep passing it through our front end. And the cookie that we'll show later on, it will save the location type and that will be sent to the algorithm to find the location from where you're starting from. And right now we're running our server on Apache 2 on Ubuntu Linux. And we're also hosting it on a virtual private server rented by Linode. This allows us to get an SSL certification to secure our website. So this is our design layout for our desktop front end version. So after we got some surveys from our last testing, we kind of made some changes. So starting with our login page, as you can see, it requires a name and then you can start a group or join an existing one. From there, you'll move to the preference pages where you will cat with all your categories, you'll categorize them from one through five, allergies equals zero. If you're a host, you will move to a location page that will let you set the location either by selecting a city or setting an actual address into the set your location. You can also set how far you are willing to travel to find a restaurant near you. After that, everyone will end up in the room page. As a host, as you see for John, he has a go button, but as a join user, you will not have that. And once the host user sees that everyone is ready, he will be sent to the algorithm page, which will display a restaurant suggestion, which right now is running Steakhouse Sushi House. That will be sent back to where suggestion waiting is for all the other users to see what was selected from the algorithm. So now onto our mobile front end, knowing that most people will probably use a mobile version, we also set up a mobile front end. It's pretty much the same functionality as the rest. You'll move from a login to preference. If you're a host to location, then everyone will move to the room and then host will move to algorithm. These two are interchangeable. The desktop and mobile versions say if the host is running on desktop, anyone who's using mobile will still be able to access the same room from the mobile phone and vice versa. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about uh, our database in a little more depth and how we communicate with our database. We use MySQL to uh, manage our database. Uh, and communication between the front end is usually done with um, PHP and AJAX calls. So whenever we want to either retrieve information from a table or insert information into a table, we'll basically call, we'll you basically use an AJAX call to call a separate PHP file that contains the SQL query that we want to run on uh, whatever table it is we want to run. And you can see below here, this is how um, our tables are laid out. We have it set up to where each table is one room um, that a group is using. So you can see here, this is uh, pretty much an example of one room with three members in it. You can see that it stores the name of members of a group along with all of the preferences that each person has set for each category. You can see that's all integers from one to five and also a zero indicating an allergy for a particular food group. You can see that we also store ready status which basically relays back to the host that uh, each member is has submitted their preferences and is ready to receive a result. In addition, once the algorithm returns a final restaurant back to the host, we store that result um, into the table as well under the results column. That's basically just so we can relay that information back to the other members of the group that aren't the host. So that's kind of how our uh, database is laid out. So now on to the algorithm and API calls. The purpose of this algorithm is to retrieve a restaurant suggestion that suits the needs of the users while also making as few API calls as possible. Um, so we broke down the functionality of this uh, um, algorithm into seven basic steps, starting off with receiving data from the database. Whenever the host presses the go button, the algorithm will run and will take the data from the database for that group. It will then filter out all of the allergies. Uh, as we've kind of hinted at before, if someone does say that they are allergic to a certain type of food, it will return a zero. And what we do with that is we'll look through their uh, data for their group and we'll set everyone's suggestion for that category to be zero as well. Uh, we'll get to why that is in just a second. So we're then going to go through and we're gonna calculate the average for every single category and randomly select a category based off of the ratings. So if a rating has a very high, uh, if a category has a very high rating, such as a five star for something like Italian food, that's going to have a higher chance of being picked as something that has a three star. However, if anything has less than a three star rating, then it's not going to be picked at all. 
the reason why we have allergies set to zero and then set everyone else's is to guarantee that the average for that food type will in fact be zero so that it won't be called whenever we make the API call. Uh, so we then use Google Places API to make a nearby search request for that type of food and randomly select a single place from that nearby search's results. Uh, we then forward the results to the database to then be forwarded to the front end for our users to see. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the security measures we have in place. Uh, we were thinking about security from the very beginning uh, when we started this project. Uh, one of the first things we did was decide on a name and go ahead and register a domain. Uh, and when we did that, we ensured that we had WhoisGuard protection enabled, which just means if you look up the domain registration information, it's not gonna leak any of our personal data addresses or contact info. Uh, you'll get sort of a generic result, which is good for our privacy. Um, additionally, as soon as we had the server configured, we of course set up the firewall to disable any unnecessary ports. Uh, uh, we only have about three ports open at the moment. Uh, but to add an extra layer of security on top of that, we also enable the service called fail to ban on our SSH port. Uh, and what this does is helps prevent us from getting uh, brute force attacked uh, from a, some number of botnets or something uh, by banning any IP address that attempts to SSH into our server with an incorrect password three or more times. After the third attempt, it just drops the connection and will not let that person attempt to reconnect. Um, additionally, our, serve, our uh, website is fully HTTPS enabled. We have a valid root authority signed certificate um, issued via CertBot, uh, which is a project funded by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, so you'll notice here in a minute on our demo, all of the pages are HTTPS and uh, properly signed. So our connections are encrypted and um, authoritative. Um, and finally, I spent a decent amount of time working on sanitizing a lot of the inputs on our websites to make us significantly less susceptible to something like an SQL injection attack. Uh, a lot of our inputs, of course, pass data off to a database, which is immediately an area of concern because we don't want somebody to be able to type like, um, quote, drop table uh, as their name and cause issues on our server. So we put significant time and effort into making sure that those kinds of inputs aren't going to mess anything up uh, catastrophically. All right, so now we're going to move on to a live demo of our website. Um, we ask that even though this site is live and we'll be creating a real room, um, only our team members join the room for the sake of this demo just to um, appease the demo gods as much as possible. Um, but you feel free to make your own rooms and test it out at some point if you want. Um, so this is a, the main page of our website. Should be up. Wait, nope. Okay. This is the main page of our website. Um, as you can see, it's um, pretty simple. We've got a spot to enter a name and a button to start or join a group. Um, in this case, I'm going to put my name in and start a group for us. Uh, I'm going to call it demo room, all one word, all lowercase. Uh, then it drops me on my preferences page. Uh, if I didn't have any previously cached preferences, this would be straight threes down the line. Um, but in this case, it goes ahead and restores the, my previous preference entry, which of course I can change should I want to at any given time. Uh, I can then hit submit and move on to the next page. Since I'm the host, I have the option of setting our radius between uh, one and 30 miles and also entering our location. Uh, you could enter a specific address if you wanted to, but for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to put in Ruston in general. Okay. So now we're on the main page for our website. You can see we've got a couple of people in the room already uh, showing their ready status. Uh, ready status indicates whether or not they have made it past the page where they enter their food preferences. Uh, once everybody is ready, I know I'm clear to go ahead and hit the go button and get a suggestion. Uh, additionally, we identify who the host of the room is and what the passphrase for entering the room needs to be uh, in case you forget what you typed in. 
Uh, once I hit this go button, everyone else in the room is also going to see the suggestion pop up here under the waiting selection. Okay, so it looks like everybody's in the room now. So I'm going to go ahead and get, hit go and we'll get our suggestion. And it looks like we're going to McAllister's, which is tasty. Uh, at this point, if we were all satisfied with our restaurant suggestion, I could go ahead and hit all done and that would close out the database table and return me back to the homepage for the website. Or if for some reason we decided we didn't want to go to McAllister's, maybe we know it was going to be super crowded tonight or something. Um, I could just go ahead and hit the new suggestion button like this and it will give us a new restaurant idea, in this case, Sonic. So saying we're all happy with this restaurant, we're gonna go there and go ahead and click the all done button, which will end this session and drop me back on the home page. So that's it for our demo. I'm gonna go ahead and switch back to our slides and we will continue our presentation. So this next section, we're gonna go over some of the challenges that we faced and uh, you'll notice that a lot of them are things that we basically just had to learn in order to make this uh, project functional. Um, so first off, team members had a very limited experience in the relevant program, programming languages, uh, things like uh, PHP and uh, JavaScript, we really didn't have a lot of experience with. In fact, some of us had never touched it. So we had to get a basic understanding of those languages in order to make this website. Uh, we had to learn about Ajax calls and how to do them in order to communicate from uh, different files within our system. Uh, we had to learn profiling tools and automated testing partially because this was a requirement over the course of our uh, class, but also because we wanted to make sure that um, our product was not only functional, but it was uh, efficient as well. Um, so we were able to learn different programming tools uh, that uh, helped with automated testing in order to make sure that what we were producing was a good and viable product. Um, next, team members needed to research Google API calling and JSON responses. Um, that was primarily me. I had never used Google API calling. I'd never had to deal with JSONs. So I had to completely learn from the beginning on how to function that in order to make the algorithm run. Um, the next two are things that we got back from whenever we had a live demo version. This included uh, friends, family, and teachers. Uh, we ho had uh, kind of thrown out a open beta for people to uh, submit responses back so the first thing was that formatting from the front end for mobile versions didn't fit every screen. Um, so Stella and Bradford worked on the front end for mobile and it was working well on their screen. However, if someone had a slightly different size screen or a tablet, it would uh, shift the places of buttons around and it kind of made it look a little bit sloppy. So uh, we had to fix some of the formatting for the mobile versions. In addition, uh, we also had to format the website in a way that was more intuitive for general users. We had some people that would log on and it would make perfect sense to them. Others, it kind of didn't. So if you notice during our walkthrough, it was very streamlined. It kind of forced you to go from page to page in a specific order. Um, in the past, it didn't do that. It was much more open-ended and that caused people to be confused on what they were supposed to do first, what was supposed to come next, and just the general order of like what they were supposed to do and how to function uh, this uh, software. So lastly, for the future, we are considering options for continuing deployment development after graduation, whereas adding new features or making it into mobile application, hopefully it could be turned into a widely used application and let's see if we can make some profit out of it. So thank you guys so much for listening to our presentation. We will now open up the floor for any questions. Okay, thank you guys. Um, uh, I have uh, some questions from the audience. I also have a comment to start with, and that is um, one member of the uh, industry advisory board noted that uh, he believed that this could be very useful uh, once Louisiana opens back up post COVID. Um, mm -hmm. The other question is kind of related because it deals with, uh, with scalability, which is one of the last things you guys just mentioned. Um, this is from a uh, one of our board members, uh, if you needed to scale this up to serve uh, 10 million people a day, uh, this board member used to work at Google, um, what would you, uh, what would be the limitations that you would need to overcome to be able to scale this thing, you know, massively? 
So some of the big limitations that I know we would run into, uh, first off, we would definitely need to uh, get a much more powerful virtual private server. Uh, we're on the cheapest option Linode has right now, so we'd need to purchase more compute power uh, for sure. But fortunately, VPSs allow for that fairly easily. Um, Additionally, I think our largest single bottleneck would end up being our database. Uh, none of us are really database experts and uh, database performance is something that is very heavily linked to this website. Um, if the database slows down, basically everything is going to get slowed. Um, additionally, we're very reliant on the returning from the API calls. Uh, to Google. So that's a another potential bottleneck we'd have to worry about uh, as we expand and scale. Uh, especially with that API call thing. Um, for each API call, uh, we have a certain amount free each month, but once we exceed that, it's going to start costing money. So we're going to need some sort of revenue in or to turn around and make uh, in order to pay for all those API calls that we're making. So, so that actually works nicely into the next question, which is how would you guys monetize this? <laughs> so we had a couple of ideas for monetization um, based on some talks we had early on just just for fun. Um, there's the classic um, ads option. Nobody likes those, but there are distinctly places on our websites where we could fit them in without being particularly intrusive. Um, we'd also tossed around the idea of potentially assuming it got big enough working with specific restaurants to have sort of um, sponsored suggestions, so to speak, within a specific category, preferring one restaurant over another or something um, based on sort of a paying us for advertising kind of a basis. Another idea we could have would be just subscription wise, whether if we do turn it into an application, if we do have this application, we can do, for example, $2.99 a month or $2.99 maybe a week if it got really popular and monetize it through that way. Uh, awesome. Um, another question that, that also deals with this concept of, uh, of release and scaling it up uh, was a question about security. It says, uh, did you guys consider security considerations when implementing um, um, uh, the system to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be cognizant of personal privacy? And, and what the question asker here is, uh, you know, it might be kind of icky if there was like a stalker that was like watching your food preferences and your lunch plans and stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we, we try to do our best to minimize the amount of data we collected, first of all. Um, you're not required to enter your real name as your actual name. Uh, you could enter anything you want, um, nickname, some sort of username. Um, additionally, the location is also uh, what you specify and not drawn from your computer. So you can use a generic location like Ruston instead of your home address. Um, and finally, and probably the largest factor is once you're done getting a suggestion, the database table gets wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't maintain any of the data that we collect about our users, names, locations, preferences, any of that on our server at all. The preference caching is done locally on the user's web browser and the database table that contains their name, uh, their location and their preferences is generated when you create a room and, uh, re and uh, that table is removed when you're done with that room. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's not really any persistence that you could use necessarily to track an individual person. A, a kind of another kind of a general question is, is it possible to ban room participants uh, if they just keep, you know, they don't care their preferences and maybe they make a disparaging comment about someone else's food preferences or something? Um, that's not possible at this time, but it is something that is definitely on our roadmap if we have the ability to continue developing this after we graduate. Mm -hmm. it, it's certainly on the list of features that we need to implement. It was a stretch goal we had. We just didn't get to it in time. Yeah. And here, finally, is a, is a question from your moderator, Mike O'Neill himself. Um, why did you guys go with the room model? And uh, I mean, I realize that rooms are just self-forming groups of people who want to have lunch together. 
Um, but might the room terminology throw off some of us <coughs> uh, older potential users who are really not, you know, a Discord uh, conversant? Yeah, maybe we had that, we had know, that Jacob. issue early on. That's part of the reason um, originally those buttons at the start said start and join a room, and that caused a little confusion. We, we changed those buttons to read group. Uh, rooms is, is how we thought of it initially and is how we have been referring to it internally. Most of the places on the website um, should say group now to make it a little bit more clear. Um, the idea came from basically stuff like the, the Jackbox Party Pack games and um, stuff like um, those big quiz uh, uh, games that a lot of classes use. Um, sort of as our, our model for how we wanted it to operate. And originally, if you remember, we had like the tabs at the top of the room in the earlier sprints, but after receiving feedback from surveys, we really streamlined the process for anybody. We kind of guide the user through the experience now, forcing them to uh, set the preferences before seeing the room instead of just letting them kind of run wild once they're in a room. So we think <laughs> that we've really streamlined the process a lot more uh, in the past couple of sprints. Mm -hmm. So hopefully everybody should be able to use it uh, with relative ease. Okay, well, uh, that, that was awesome. Again, if, if you could all go to your little emojis and, and give a big hand for uh, for Vakru and their uh, 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 lunch, uh, we, that would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, um, next up, we have uh, Team Nick of Time. And uh, Team Nick of Time is, uh, their, their app is called the Perfect Photo App. So uh, team uh, Nick time, if you guys could take it away in the nick of time, uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. O'Neill said, we're the team nick of time. We worked on the perfect photo app. I'm Samuel Allman, and I focused on facial motion, smile, and eye detection. I'm Zach Clute. I focused on integrating open CV, facial smile, and eye detection. I'm Nirjala Parajuli. I worked on the overall workings of the apps, different buttons, and overall look of the app. And I'm Bibut Kharga, and I worked on the gallery of the app, as well as displaying pictures that you've taken. Uh, so here's our outline for the presentation. Uh, we're going to start our presentation by discussing the problem that we started out to work with. So the problem was, uh, whenever you're taking a group picture, it's always hard to get a perfect picture that everyone in the group is satisfied with. So uh, this is a problem that we wanted to work on. And as we move through our presentation, we'll discuss our approach and all the tools that we used to work on the problem. And towards the end of our presentation, uh, we will discuss, I mean, we'll show a demo of our project showing how everything's working uh, and the, yeah, that. We all know at one point in our life, we all might have faced some situations where taking group photos is really hard. Either we have to ask someone to take the photo for us, or we have to set a timer to get a good picture. And we also often face problems where someone is not smiling, or someone has their eyes closed, or someone is moving, or all of them together. So we have tried to create something that will solve this problem. So moving on to our approach, this is a big problem. So how do we plan on fixing this? We decided to focus on facial recognition and image processing technologies. Specifically, we're using smile detection so that we can make sure that everyone is smiling. Eye detection so that we can make sure everyone has their eyes open. Motion detection so that we can make sure no one is moving. And wrapping all of this together, automatic photo taking based on these conditions so that no one has to take the photo, no timers have to be used, no one has to ask someone to take the photo, and no one has to be left out so that they can be the one taking the photo. And this is, of course, wrapped up in the same basic camera functionality that everyone expects from a smartphone. These are the tools we use to accomplish our projects. We use the Scrum framework to organize our tasks into stories and divide work across sprints. In order to organize our sprints, we used Trello, and this is where we kept track of the progress of our stories during sprints. We used GitHub for con uh, version control and collaboration. For communication, we used GroupMe for general messaging, and we used Zoom to hold our standups. 
We developed our app using Android Studio IDE, and we took advantage of its built-in profiler, unit testing, and UI testing. We developed our app for phones running on Android OS. We use Java as the programming language and the OpenCV library for facial, smile, eye, and motion detection. We've integrated OpenCV into the app itself, so no separate tools need to be installed in order for it to run. It also should be noted that our app does not use any web technologies and it does not interact with the internet itself, so it is also more secure because of this. Next, we can move on to the demo. And as I get the demo, the phone mirrored, I would like to say that this phone has a very wide angle front facing camera, which is good for group photos, but it makes the facial recognition things a little more difficult. So bear that in mind. And it's hard to use the back facing camera because I need to be doing things on the demo. So uh, this is our app, as you can see, when we open it, it asks for user permission. And if we allow to use the camera, we can see the whole camera. Now, when we press the capture button, you're able to take the picture. You can also see the screen flashing when the photo is taken. Sound cannot be heard right now because of the nature of our Zoom call, but we have sound implemented and whenever a user is taking picture, you can hear the sound feedback. You can also switch your camera button. Front or back camera can be used accordingly. There's also a flash feature. Since right now we have not used flash, it's white in color, but when we take a picture, if it's facing back camera, since we have flash feature on, on back camera, when we take the picture from our uh, back camera, you can see the flash icon turns to yellow, which means it's working right now. And now, uh, moving on, uh, I'm going to walk you through the gallery. So as you can see, it's just like a gallery in any other phone. Uh, it displays all of your pictures in a grid view. And then uh, you, you can select one picture and expand on it. And at the bottom of the screen, you, uh, it'll show you the in, uh, four different options. And the leftmost will show you the information of the photo like when it was taken or, and the date. And then uh, it will all, you also have the option to delete a photo and also export a photo. So if you export a photo, it will go to the Android gallery. So if you don't export, it will stay in the app and it will only go to the Android gallery after you export the photo. And also you also have the option to share the photo and the sharing function is based on the Android sharing. So whichever platforms that Android will allow to share, you can share from this app too. And uh, so you can swipe between photos to navigate where you are. So it will give you a slow animation moving through the photos. And you can press the back button on your phone and it will take you back to the gallery with the grid view. And from there, you have the option to uh, select multiple photos and uh, delete, share, or export them, uh, which, whatever you want. And you can uh, press back button and go back to the app and start taking photos again. As you can see, uh, facial detection is on by default and a box is drawn around a person's face when it's detected. In order to make this work, we used a frame-by-frame -frame image conversion technique to put the image into the form OpenCV wanted namely converting the frame from a uh, camera's native NV21YUV format to RGB. And these frames are stored in a matrix, and once the face is recognized, it's put into a separate matrix for other image processing, such as eyes and smiles. So now if we go to the settings page, we can see we have multiple toggles, and right now they're all currently toggled off. So if we toggle smile detection, and we go back to the camera, we can see that there's a visual indicator at the bottom of the box for when someone is smiling and when they actually smile, it, it works. So now if we go back, we could toggle on eye detection. There is now another indicator that determines whether their eyes are both open. And now you can see there's a color 
colors are on the box. Uh, red is when nothing is detected. Yellow is when some criteria are met, but not all. And green is when all the criteria are met. So now we can go back to the settings and turn on facial motion detection. And you see there's now an indicator that displays when a face is moving. That also takes into account the color. It's a little wonky with the phone sometimes. So it stops moving. So now we can go back and turn on general motion detection, which takes into account the whole frame instead of just the face. So if one was to move their hand, it would say motion detected at the bottom. And now if we uh, were to close the app and reopen it, we can see that all of our settings will have been remembered. And now we will move on to the feature that ties all of these together. So as Zach said, we have all of these different things that we're detecting, but the point of detecting them is so that we can take a photo when we want to. However, as you can tell, sometimes you may not want it to automatically take a photo. So that's why we have a toggle up in the top left corner. If we turn it on, it'll take a photo when all of the conditions are met, but it'll only take a photo when the toggle is on so that it's not taking photos when you don't want it to. If, for example, you're setting up your phone or getting ready to take a photo, you don't want it to take a photo just because briefly you smiled and weren't moving and had your eyes open. Additionally, this button, of course, also works if you turn some things off. For example, I'm holding the phone right now, so it's detecting some motion, but that doesn't mean my face is actually moving, so those settings may be annoying. Ideally, I'd be able to set my phone up somewhere, but because there's a cord attached so that I can mirror the screen, that's uh, not currently easy, easy, easy to do. and it still works and takes a photo based on those conditions. Additionally, you may have noticed that there's one more setting we didn't get into. And this is because this setting is more geared toward the automatic photo taking itself. In the settings, it's called time detection tolerance. And basically what it does is if a face is nearly correct, but not quite, as in there's just one thing off. For example, if I was smiling and I wasn't moving my face, but I had my eyes open, so there's only one thing that isn't right. It starts a timer, and once this timer reaches halfway, it'll actually show up on the screen. As you can see there, it's showing up, and it's green, and it's showing up while I'm talking right now because it's not de I'm detecting that I'm smiling because I'm talking, but my eyes are open, and since the facial motion detection is off, it's currently off. If auto photo capture was enabled, it would take a photo, as you can see. And this is just so that if for some reason it doesn't want to recognize someone's smile or someone's eyes, it'll still take a photo if they don't, if nothing changes. It assumes then that since nothing is changing, they must still want it to take a photo and they're just waiting for it to. And that's all of the settings. So for, for our sideways feature of the camera, if we just want to take the picture in a portrait mode, you can do so. If you want to take the picture in a landscape mode, it supports that too. So if you turn your phone sideways, the pictures are going to be taken according to the orientation of the camera. So if we go to gallery after taking the pictures, you can see when the gallery is in landscape mode, the pictures automatically adjust according to the orientation of the phone. But if it's in portrait mode, it adjusts according to the portrait orientation. So if you go to an individual picture in the gallery, if you go to the landslide mode, landscape mode, you can see that it adjusts according to the landscape orientation. But if you go to the portrait orientation, it adjust according to the requirements of the portrait orientations. Also, if you go to the settings, you can see that 
in our portrait orientation, you can see that the buttons are closed according to the size of the portrait orientation. But if you go to the landscape orientation, the buttons move farther away to the um, screen uh, so that it adjusts according to the orientation of the screen. So that right now it's landscape orientation, the buttons move farther. But if it's in portrait orientation, they move further closer and adjust according to the orientation of the phone. There is one more feature that we can talk about, and that is localization. Localization is, of course, translation to other languages and making it so that it is appropriate for different locales. We have our app set up so that you can have it in English, Spanish, or French, and it'll base it based on the settings of the phone. If your phone is in Spanish, then it will use Spanish. And as you can see, all of the strings are now translated into Spanish. And it is only translated into Spanish and French from English right now, but going through the process of setting this up took a decent amount of time and going through the process of translating all of the strings is a lot quicker. So it could very easily be translated into any other language so that it's appropriate for many different locations now and many different users could use it even if they don't speak English. And that is the end of our demo. So now uh, to summarize our presentation, uh, we know that group photos are always gonna be difficult to take because there are a lot of people involved and it's hard to coordinate between all of them, but, and anything can go wrong. But to fix that, we made an app using facial detection, smile detection, eye detection, and motion detection. So we can take the perfect photo. I mean, group photos will definitely be hard to take, but with our app, it will be a lot more user-friendly, simple, and easier. And uh, most of the times, the, most of the times, it's always perfect photo that the app's going to capture. Uh, so now we can take any questions. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I, I believe you, you, you guys said that y'all are ready for questions. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, I do have a few questions from the audience. Um, first one is, have you guys thought about um, providing intelligent verbal feedback? There's a lot of feedback on the screen, but again, if you're taking photos and stuff like that, it, it might be hard to read all of that. And the uh, question is, ask her had like, you know, like, um, please smile. There are three of you not smiling, you know, some sort of verbal feedback. Uh, what would be involved with trying to add something like that? I think the first thing we would need to do is get the audio to create that verbal feedback. But in terms of measuring it and deciding what is said, for example, three smiles, three of you are not smiling, we know what faces are detected and what faces aren't smiling. There's a reason we made it so that it plays a shutter sound so that if you do have the camera set up somewhere, you can tell if it took a photo. And this is something that we could consider in the future if we wanted to add verbal feedback. Okay, thank you. Uh, in a similar vein uh, to, to voice output, have you considered voice input um, you know, like um, uh, say ready to begin the scanning process uh, when everyone's in place or something like that. Both of these questions are, are trying to, um, you know, focus more on, well, it's not hands-free because somebody's holding the, the camera, but, but, but uh, you know, as close to hands-free as possible. Eyes-free, I guess, because <laughs> you're trying to take a photo. Uh, we've, we've given it consideration, but when implementing it, we did not. Uh, reach that that point so yeah. also, we did a stretch goal yeah also to add to it it was one of our stretch goals uh, that if we work on future together after graduation we would definitely work on it but this was definitely one of our stretch goals and uh, if given chance and if everything works fine for us and if we get to work together after our graduation we'll definitely look into it and one more thing i would like to say that it is mostly hands-free. 
ideally you would set up the phone somewhere on a tripod or something and then step away and since it automatically takes a photo you don't need to use your hands but because of the cord and because of the whole setup for this meeting i was unable to have some place to set the phone up okay thanks very much another question is um where did the uh, underlying algorithms come from i mean we assume that you didn't you know write the facial detection algorithms or the eye open algorithms or things like that. Where, where do these algorithms come from and what was the integration process like uh, to integrate them? We used uh, cascade classifiers given by the OpenCV library and implementing them wasn't necessarily as hard of just coding but more getting it to work with the camera of the phone. And the motion detection is a simple um, it calculates the difference between pixels, just the absolute difference. And then it is a binary. If the difference is larger than a certain value, it makes that a one. And if it's lower, it makes that a zero. And then it averages all of those together to get basically a, a heuristic of how much has changed from frame to frame. And that's how it does the motion detection. So Sam, just so that I'm clear, so you're saying that you that your team did actually implement um, some of these algorithms rather than just uh, grabbing them from libraries? Am, am I hearing yes. you correct on that? Yeah. So yes, I implemented the motion detection and OpenCV has some simple functions to do like the absolute difference between two matrices, for example. And so it's, I think, it's a total of maybe four lines of code in the end. So it's very simple. I had to research to try and figure out what the best way to do motion detection would be, but it isn't someone else's code that I copied. I looked at other people's implementations and I decided what we were going to do for, for this project because also we wanted it to run quicker because a lot of the detection is more intensive. And so adding motion detection, we wanted it to not add too much processing on top. Uh, so yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for pointing that out. That That's very impressive, very impressive. Um, there are also uh, a, a question that I had was, uh, so are there any stability issues? I mean, I, I know this is an app that gets downloaded to a phone, but uh, is there any, is there any back-end connectivity or, or anything that, that could be a bottleneck if, say, this thing needed to scale to to millions of users or would you just put it up and let a million users download it? I think um, as Zach said, we don't use the internet. I was gonna say- uh, Hopefully one, you would use the internet to, to get it to the public. One, one problem is the OpenCV library uh, is it, it, if, if, you want to, if you want it to run in uh, like uh, undebug mode or in regular mode, you need to download the OpenCV manager unless you uh, integrate the library itself into the app. And we've done that, but it, it, it loads the, uh, the library on the front on the main thread as the app loads. So the, scale, the scalability, it's a little wonky when it loads. So that might be a, a problem. I didn't explain that well. So, um one one more question we have here. It's the standard monetization question. How would you guys go about monetizing? Oh, I see. I see Zach Grimace when I said that. So, how would you guys monetize uh, monetize this? Because come on, we we want to get it out there and we want to make bucks too, right? I think generally we've considered the, the thing we've considered the most would just be something simple like ads, but. It doesn't really, no one wants an ad on a phone. So I think that is a problem with addressing where to put things on the screen for that. So it's not but also problem. know that since we're not, we wouldn't need to maintain any servers other than making sure people are able to download the app. Um, the maintenance costs would be very low so we don't need as much incoming money to make a profit. 
So, so based on all of that, uh, then I have, a, I have a, a less academic and more real world question. Are you guys actually planning to, to put this up? Or have you done so? Uh, uh, what, are, what are the actual, rather than the, let's get through the presentation answers, what's the actual answer to, are we actually gonna put this thing out there and see if people start using it? So we've yes. thought about it and we haven't had enough testing, especially for group photos, especially due to the whole COVID-19 thing. So we'd like to be able to test it some more because at larger, at longer distances and with more people, it becomes a lot slower and it also a lot consist less consistent. So we have to be able to test that a lot more before I'd, I'd say we'd be feel comfortable releasing it publicly. Also, uh, we know for sure that a lot of people are interested in our app and if it was not uh, given for the current situation that we're facing right now, we would have a lot of people taking uh, user testings on our app and um, maybe we would have more encouraged by that, but we're planning to do more user testings our app. It was one of our thing uh, before we uh, put in the presentation that maybe after everything is over, we could take a picture with our app after everything is over and put it up in social media, but right now we're not able to do so. But after this is over, we're planning to do something like that. And after seeing people's responses, we're going to decide accordingly. And it's, it definitely, I feel like it's a good idea. So if we get good responses, we're definitely going to put it up for people to use it with a more uh, better interface and uh, functionalities. Yeah, I would really encourage you guys to do that because uh, if, if nothing else, it would be a really great line on your resume that your uh, senior design project actually led to a, uh, you know, a, 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 a appware that was released, and especially if it gets downloaded and used by people, that would be a really, really great, um, great selling point. A um, couple of other questions that I have here is: uh, Have you guys thought about what would be involved with a port to iOS? I think one of the original reasons we didn't do iOS is setting up the development environment would have been a lot harder. I have a Mac, but no one else on our team does. And the easiest way to develop for iOS is on Mac. And I don't currently know if OpenCV is available for iOS, but because of because Apple tries to keep their ecosystem closed, all of the options to develop on Windows were more restricted. And so that's why we chose Android is because Android was more open and more accessible for all of us. And I think there are a lot of limitations because it relies heavily, it's more, a lot of it is more hardware level than say a web app. Another question, it's really not a question, it's a suggestion, but I think it's a great suggestion, is uh, you guys should do a group, group photo um, taken with the, um, with, with the camera as soon as the COVID-19 allows, allows us to be co-located physically together. But that would really be, be great. I would love a copy of it, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that Dr. Gordon would love one, too. Um, that, would, that, would be a nice, that would be a nice way of... Uh, of, um, of capping off your capstone is if you, uh, if you guys had a photo taken by your own application. Um, um, there was one other question um, about um, have you guys, since, since you did develop some of the algorithms yourself, uh, and obviously you've developed the interface in any of this, would you potentially, if it became a possibility, consider selling the IP to a uh, a larger company who might be able to do something something with it. That's something uh, we haven't thought about right now. But if given um, really good opportunities like that, uh, we will obviously um, think about how uh, we, uh, if we were able to expand and make our own company off of it, then we would definitely go with it. But if it looks like okay, where it's going to be great for us to sell this uh, and make profit out of it, then um, you know, 
it's it's better for us to give it in uh, more firmer hands than uh, ours because we're just graduate students or if we somehow uh, in future have um, uh, like um, have some de determination to establish our own company we'll definitely go with our own company but if given chance we would definitely go and sell with sell to a big company and make it huge if possible <laughs> i think right now it's not robust enough to be a sellable product so i think we would have to work on it for a little bit more to especially make all the detection more consistent but after that i think selling it is so, so zach do you have a following up on that do you have an idea of, of how much time and effort it would really take to take it from this beta stage that it's in to uh, to something that, that that you feel would could could go for widespread release? Maybe that's a question for Sam. I don't know. Um, probably. I can't tell you how much effort it would take, but I can tell you it's taken a lot of effort up to this point. That I would not like to think about how much time I've we've all put into this. Even just getting it to recognize our face when we turned the phone sideways, that uh, kept me up past 3 a.m. one night. So, well, well, I, well, I can tell you that the, that the results do look impressive. And so I would actually encourage you guys to, uh, to, to stick with this. I think, you know, you can always release this as a closed beta or even an open beta and, and get feedback on it. And sometimes you can get people out there um, you know, on the internet, who would be willing to um, to help develop it, especially if you decide to go with the freeware model and write off the idea of making money off of it, you know, um, because it, it looks quite impressive. I mean, it truly does. So uh, thank you guys. It's uh, time for us to all give our little, uh, our little hand clap emojis um, to, uh, to uh, Team Nick of Time with their uh, perfect photo apps. So thank you guys for doing that. Uh, if you guys could unshare your screen, I noticed that uh, Sam, you're still sharing. Thank you, Sam. Um, and I would also add that first, please try to remember to uh, unshare your screen when we go to the question and answering section. It, it makes it much nicer if we can actually see your faces uh, rather than look at your screen when, when we're answering questions. So uh, with that, uh, we're um, up to um, team null pointer exception, who hopefully had no null pointer exceptions when they, uh, when <laughs> in their final product. Um, the um, the um, um, product the, that, they're, that they've been working on or the project that they've been working on is called MIDI. It's the map input to text for you uh, application. And this application actually came about due to um, a standing frustration that students have uh, at Tech. Uh, there's a system called WebWork uh, that's been in place for many years, and and those students who go through the math classes, you, it's basically an online homework system for uh, for the math classes here at Tech. The problem with it is, well, the good thing is, is it allows professors to assign a lot of uh, a lot of math problems to be worked, and then automatically grade those and give feedback to the students, etc. The downside of it is, is that you have to type in your answers in this very linear, um, not, not very um, user-friendly format. And so the MIDI group, um, they, they, the task that they took on was to see if they could make this um, somewhat easier to do for students. So uh, take it away, team null pointer exception. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ebony Williams. I'm the lead presenter for Null Pointer Exception. I was in charge of icon creation, uh, back-end development, integration between the front-end and the back-end, as well as deployment and a general assistance to anyone who needed me. Hi, I'm Owen Sitka. I was in charge of back-end algorithm design, uh, live input acceptance, the file input method, and I did some stress testing as well. Hey, I'm in Hal Chrisling. I was in charge of image preview and the cropping. I also handle the usability tests, as well as the snipping tool that was eventually removed. I'm Lindsay Kaysen, and I handled the general web page design and also ensuring browser support and device compatibility. 
In addition, I worked with profiling and I assisted wherever else I was needed during the project. I'm on Gitarial. Uh, I worked on the input method using camera. I also worked on profiling and uh, I worked on attaching system ID to all uh, pictures, but that was later removed. All right, so now that you've met all of us, we'd like you to meet our product. So, what we'll present today, we're going to begin with the problem that is behind our project, like Dr. O'Neill just mentioned. Then we're going to go into our solution to this problem, which is METI, our product. Then we're going to talk about the design that's behind METI, also the consideration involved when we was implemented. Lastly, we will have a live demo session. Let's begin with our problem, the web work. In at the recent Tech University, WebWork is a platform that was used to give homework to students taking calculus, discrete mathematics, statics, and other math classes. And uh, we're going to show a very quick example of um, this math 244, 242, which is calculus 2. Sometimes a student will receive a question on the right that has very complicated in the solution. How would you enter this into WebWork? Now, an experienced web worker knows uh, exactly how frustrating it is to work with uh, multiple parentheses involved. And to top it off with a really complex problem, you could miss one parenthesis or just one uh, letter and then uh, lose all your homework points. So now we have a solution for this and our solution is MIDI. Uh, imagine how easy it would be to just take a picture of your working handwritten problem and then uh, get it converted into properly formatted web work accepted form of equations. So uh, with our product MIDI, now you can actually do that. Now you can math input the text for you. So as we suggested, our product MIDI can take a picture of a long equation or complicated equations that you may have written on your scratch work or wherever you're working from and be able to convert it into a plain text format that you can paste into your online math homework website. On our website, you can preview the answer we generate and also check your answer, copy and paste. So let's move on to how MIDI was created. Um, we'll start off with the collaboration tools we used. Discord was good for ensuring that we all stayed in communication to each with each other and be able to ask questions and everything. Trello allowed us to keep track of our tasks and GitHub allowed us to have our code in a central location and be able to see what we've all done. Moving on to the actual implementation of our website, our front end uses React.js and our back end utilizes Flask. In the back end, we use the API MathPix, which takes the images of the equations we receive through MIDI and translate them into latex form, which we'll later, later parse for our users. We also utilize the email JS API to be able to allow our users to email us through the page itself. So moving on to the more visual end, the design of the website is important for the usability of the website. We wanna make sure that our page is structured in a way that our users can easily go through. So there was a big emphasis on utilizing CSS to, to lay out our page properly. In addition to that, we used MathJax, which is a API we use to dynamically give our users a equation preview to check their answers. So now that we've created our website, we need a way to deploy it. So we actually used DreamHost to host and buy our domain name, and then we used Heroku to deploy and build the website. And then we use point DNS to set up any DNS records. That way it's actually accessible on the web right now. Um, then moving on to some of the testing tools that we used, we actually used humans in the sense of user testing. And this is used to fix any GUI issues or any obvious inconsistencies in the website that might make it difficult to use. Uh, Selenium for some general usage testing and then any other automated testing you might need. We used a load runner uh, free trial for the load and stress testing of the website uh, and it passed with flying colors. And then the Firefox remote debugger was used to test any phone or tablet kind of usage. 
Um, some of the tools that didn't really fit into any of these categories uh, were Screen, which is a um, it is a network security kind of thing. It allows us to monitor traffic to the website as well as block common methods of attack such as DDoS. And then we also use the Chrome profiler and that just reduces on some inefficiencies in the website such as large numbers of listen listeners on a page uh, due, due to listeners being deallocated. So that was actually something we had to face. With these tools in mind, the next thing we had to do was consider our users. And we considered our users through two different methods, both usability and privacy. So starting with usability, we wanted our website to be as easy to use as possible. So we tried to keep the design as simple as possible. But we went beyond this. We were like, what if someone's interested uh, in our code? Well, we're going to keep the framework as simple as possible as well. So say a user goes on their laptop and they can go to our website. When they submit an image of their equation, this gets sent to our back end for processing. Now, our back end does not handle the handwritten text recognition system. Instead, it queries the MathPix API to do that for it. When MathPix figures out what the handwritten information is, it sends it back to our back end, which can then says, okay, now that I have this, I can process it. But we thought, said, okay, what if there's a math teacher who really wants to see what the LA text originally looks like? This also gets sent to the front end for the user. Um, so then you say, okay, we have the LA text. We have a parser on our back end that is able to go from LA text to plain text. And this was developed by Owen that does it for us. And then this also gets sent to the front end website. And once these website receives both of these, the information is displayed to the user. Now, in the event that the user has a problem with our website or just wants to give us feedback, we also have email JS set up on our website so they can send us an email whenever they want. Now that we looked at usability, let's look at privacy. Well, our website depends on our users inputting their images in a variety of ways, among which are the clipboard, the file system, and the camera. These are all very sensitive to keeping user information private. So we had to take very careful consideration when we set these up. The first is the file system. So when we access the, uh, the file folders of the user, there's actually no file information saved at all. The images that they upload are converted to a blob image, which means it's a binary large object, and that will only exist on the web page. And if you refresh or change pages, the blob image is actually lost. So it's actually very secure in that sense. In the uh, meet, you were not assessed to your clipboard without the user's permission, and we only have access to the image that was placed into the web page, not the entire clipboard. Uh, considering camera privacy, our website has an SSL certificate, which actually ensures that the feed is encrypted. Uh, anyone who tries HTTP connection will be forced to use an HTTP as the secure connection. With these considerations in mind, we're ready to show you our demo. So the first thing I want to show is that you are forced to use an HTTPS connection. So if I type in HTTP mini.tech, notice that it will change to HTTPS. We set this up specifically just so that we can ensure that the camera information is kept secure. So this is our website and I will let Lindsay take it away. So now that we're at our website, we can see that it has a single page web application style so the users will always have the navigation bar at the top to navigate to our different pages. Um, we have our custom made logo for our users to remember us by that will always sit on top of the navigation bar. Now we'll take this, this time to see that everything on this page has been structured so that it can resize based on the size of your window. This allows for you to go half screen, have your, your homework on the other half of the screen. And this also allows for us to be device compatible. So you can pull it up on your phone and everything will resize. So now that we've seen that, let's move on to our about page. We provide our about page so our users can get some general information and just about us and about the website. And there we go. 
So now we can move on to our How It Works page where we give a little bit of documentation and a guide for our users to navigate the process of importing the image, cropping the image, and then getting your answer. And also on our website, we provide a resources page where we link to some math homework help sites. So if they get stuck, they can just go from our page to those websites. And then lastly, we have the Contact Us page. This is the page that utilizes the email JS API for our users to be able to email us. So if Ebony enters an email and then sends a message and press submit, it'll notify the user that is, uh, the email has been sent and we can go check our email midi.tech.help at gmail.com and we will see the new message, the feedback we got from the user. So now that we've seen that, we can move back to the home page of our website and we'll begin the process of actually using it. So we provide our users four ways of getting us the image. The first is through the device's file system. The second is through the device's clipboard. The third, the device's camera. And then the fourth is a live capture page where the user can write their equation on a canvas on our website. In the case, the icon of those buttons are not self-explanatory enough, when I implement the hover over function, that whenever you hover your mouth over the buttons, you can show a short description. So let's actually go ahead and begin with the clipboard. We're going to show how to use our website. As you can see, whenever you start using clipboard, it's going to tell you we're going to assist your clipboard. So if you're clicking no or anywhere outside of this box, it's going to reject you from using this functionality. And uh, we're going to do it one more time. And we'll click yes. And you will click the board. And then now we're going to buy one picture from clipboard, from snipping tool. Now, as we copy this picture, we come back. What we do is push Control V, and then now we are going to get a new image. While Ebony is getting the second image, you may see at the top the paste here. Press Control V. That is a box for our mobile users to be able to uh, be able to paste since they can't press Control V. As you can see now, as we paste the newer image, the old image will get replaced by the latest copied image in your clipboard. Now we're going to go ahead and confirm this image. As you can confirm, and uh, we're enable the cropping tool, and there will be there will be a short description above to tell you how to use the cropping tool. You can just select a range of the range you want to submit, and uh, when your mouth is moving over the picture, you're moving to a cursor of select. In the case you want to submit the entire image, you will just submit the entire image region. Now we're going to submit. And uh, now Owen, we're going to show you of our live capture. As you can see, whenever we switch the input method, it's going to show you a warning that you current, the image, current image you have in your preview might be lost if you switch input method. If you're clicking no or anywhere outside of this box, your current work will be safe and the, the option will be abort. And the, if we click yes, we will be actually switching to a different input method. So the first thing you'll notice with the live capture window is that when you scroll over it, there'll be a little pen icon. That means that you can draw on the canvas here in any color that, or with the pen here and Ebony can draw whatever she'd like, a smiley face. Uh, and then you can click on the eraser button down at the bottom and you can erase sections of it if you'd like. If you'd like to erase the whole thing though, you can go ahead and click the clear all button and it clears the screen. So Ebony can write whatever math that she'd like to. And for this example, we're actually gonna use the log base 10 just because it is a special function with web work. And it doesn't always work just because um, it's 
hard to read the log base 10, but basically the LOG function in web work is automatically read as a natural log and the log base 10 is read, you have to write L-O-G-T-E-N. So let's see what happens when we submit. Uh, we have to crop it. And there's a result and that log 10 is how web work reads log base 10. All right. Now I think we're going to switch over to the camera. All right. The next, in, uh, next input method we're going to take a look at is camera. For this demo purpose, uh, we're going to use our mobile device, uh, Evan's phone, uh, to show you the demo for camera because we figured that most of the people who wants to uh, use the camera feature uh, for input method would uh, like to do it on their phones. So uh, we're just trying, we'll just wait uh, for Ebony to connect her phone to the computer. All right, there you go. That's our website, midi.tech. Uh, once you get inside uh, and click on the camera icon, uh, you'll see a pop-up come in that, uh, well, midi would like to use your camera. Are you okay with that? So you say yes. Uh, if you don't, uh, midi will not be using your camera. And then there you have the camera. Uh, we have another feature of this. Uh, uh, when you take a picture and you're not really sure that you want that picture to be the final picture, you can always retake the picture without having to select or omit anything. So when you take another second picture, uh, basically what happens is the existing picture get overlapped with a new one, just like that. And once you're satisfied with it, you just click on submit picture or submit photo. And yet again, and just like in clipboard and live capture, the cropping option shows up and allows you to crop the reason you want to be selected. Once you do that and submit the picture, you'll get the result in plain text. All right. I believe the next uh, input method will be the file system. Uh, this one will actually do from the computer rather than the phone, just because it's a bit easier to access on Zoom. Um, you have to confirm the switch, of course. And the first thing you'll notice here is that we've actually selected types just be JPEG and PNG that you can see. However, if you think that you're smarter than the system, you can go over to the right there and click all files. And you can click on whatever you'd like to here, whatever file type you'd like, and go ahead and open it. And you will see that we actually don't accept any file types other than JPEG or PNG, and we'll warn you about that. Um, so if we go ahead and submit a actual photo of math, it will be able to accept it and convert it to the format that we need. So we're actually going to do x plus three squared is equal to four. Um, we're going to select that whole image except for some white space because that allows it to work a little bit better. And if we go ahead and submit the image, we should get the uh, math right back. So you've seen it several times now, but we haven't talked about it yet. This is our results section gets output after the API is done processing and converting. It consists of two text boxes and a few buttons. This first text box is our plain text result that you can copy if you need to, if you want to. So if I click copy result, then you can, a pop-up says, hey, you've copied it. And just to prove that I've copied it, if I go over here, hit paste, we have it in our clipboard. Now say this is wrong. You, meant to, you really meant to put 42 and not four. Well, if you click start editing, you can now change this to 42. And notice this updates whenever you change it. So this updates every time you, you change it. But say you forgot, oh, it really was supposed to be four. I can't remember what, what I had before, or I don't really feel like going back and doing all that. You can click the reset button and it'll reset to the original plain text that it was before. So let's do this. But just to show this, if I copy, now that it's updated, if I copy, the copy command gets updated as well. And so this gets updated as well. And then the last way is if you really want to see the LA text format, you can. You just click on show original LA text format and you can see the original that we parsed to get to this format. And then when you're done, you can just hide it. 
So that's our website. So in summary, sometimes WebWork provides mathematic, gives, used to provide mathematics homework as well as other subjects. Occasionally the homework involves a complicated solution that requires careful placement of parentheses to be considered correct. And this can be very frustrating for the user. So our tool MIDI allows a student to input their handwritten solution as an image and receive a plain text version to paste into WebWork. Uh, we've used various tools to design, build, and deploy this website, as well as to ensure that our user information is kept private. So with this in mind, users can input their equations using the file system, the clipboard, the camera, or even through live input on our website. And then once they have their output in plain text format, they can pre preview it, edit it, or even copy it. And then for those LA Tech enthusiasts, you can even view the original LA Tech. So this concludes our presentation. Are there any questions? So yes, we have a number of questions uh, from, uh, from the audience. Um, um, one of my questions is, is who did your graphics? They're, they're cute and non-intimidating, which is <laughs> probably something that, that's quite refreshing when you're trying to work your way through upper division math classes. So uh, I came up with the icons. I created them in paint.net. And then Lindsay uh, chose a color scheme for me. So it looked cute like the way it does. Another general question is, uh, uh, is web work a Louisiana Tech only project or do other schools use this system? Uh, it's used by other schools. You can actually, um, you can actually, if you search web work, there is a GitHub where you can see all the schools that are using it and the different versions that they have. So related to that, what do you think, uh, uh, how, how big an audience do you potentially think that there would be for the software for MIDI? Um, I think the audience would be huge simply just because it's very frustrating just to have to enter that information. And then plus, even if it's not that long, if you could just save yourself some time on this homework that's probably got like 20 questions, you probably would just go ahead and use it anyway. So uh, here are two questions. They're really related. So they're, they're sort of one question, uh, but from two different uh, members of the audience. Um, obviously, your team relied on image recognition libraries for, for the image recognition component. Uh, has your team done any testing of the accuracy of the image recognition? Uh, if so, how and to what extent? Or did you just rely on the fact that, the, of the, that, that, that those are the libraries and just said, well, that's that's how we know they're going to work. Um, um, and the related question is, when taking the picture from live capture, did you experience many translation problems? Uh, if the penmanship was sloppy, what kind of checks and balances are there to confirm uh, proper translation? So, so basically, um, how well did it work? Um, what kind of checks did you guys build into the software? And uh, what kind of testing, if any, did you do for accuracy? Well, for the testing for the API, we actually we actually had a Python script that we call API to run over a huge amount of um, image that some contains a math equation, some are typed, some are handwriting, some are in really terrible handwriting, and some does not contain math equation at all. And uh, it turns out, for some image that does not have um, math equation there, you will just randomly generate whatever in the picture that he, th he thinks is math. Like I, one time I get a 11 out of a wallpaper I use. So, but in general for those images that contains math equation, it has pretty decent accuracy for the results. I mean, if your penmanship is sloppy, it is going to have difficulty recognizing it the same as like a human would. But um, as long as you keep it kind of clean, it can usually pick up the, the handwriting or whatever it is that you're implementing. And then the last thing is, uh, we do have a few error handlings. Um, in the event that it, occasionally it would think it's not math, that it's just text, uh, it will just output the text. And then you can say, oh, okay, well, I realize now that it, it can't read it. And in the event that it can't read it at all, we have a sorry, unable to decipher message that comes up so that you know, like, um, for whatever reason, like your handwriting was too messy or there's too many things going on in the picture, it knows to, it, you know that it couldn't solve it. So you might want to try again. 
Uh, one suggestion that we got, I think, from a couple of members of the audience was, is it'd be nice if there was some way for the tool to highlight uh, when it wasn't sure of the translation. So maybe, you know, it would, it would highlight in, in yellow or in red or something parts of the translation that it was less sure on. Is there any way to do that, given the libraries that you have, to, to judge the, uh, the, the accuracy, at least that the algorithms think how accurate the translation is? Uh, I know for a fact that the API does return a confidence level. So we could do it based on confidence, but it doesn't really return uh, exactly what parts of it it's unsure. Instead, it, it returns a detection map, which is just, it takes the whole image and it goes basically pixel by pixel to determine if it sees something there and if it thinks it's math or not. Uh, so if we did that where it was like highlighting what we think is wrong, that'd be on our end to create um, a function or an, our own API that would do that for us. One second while I, while I check here. Um, so uh, uh, scanners often use TIFF or PDF as their formats. Any, any uh, interest in supporting those formats? What would be involved with that? Uh, if we did PDF, that would be very interesting. Um, because then we would have to not only be able, we have to be able to view the PDF. So the view function that we have, most of that, with the exception of the um, clipboard, we have to get it to preview. And that took us a little bit of work to get it to preview correctly. That being said, um, you should just be able, if we just add that PDFs are allowed, you should be able to come in through the file system and it should be okay. I'd have to test more to be sure though. Uh, let's, uh, let's thank everyone um, for, um, um, for uh, their presentation. Uh, and um, at this point in the schedule, we have a 30 minute break um, coming up. So I'm going to uh, pause video and uh, we'll take a 30 minute break so we can all stand up and walk around, maybe grab a, a, a virtual snack. We can't provide them for you guys since um, since we're all in, in, in different places. And I don't have Star Trek replicator technology that works over the internet yet. Dang, maybe that'll be a, a topic for, um, for senior capstone next year. But anyway, so um, we'll, we'll meet back in, uh, in 30 minutes uh, at the bottom of the hour and we'll pick it up here. So um, thank you guys, appreciate it. Okay, so uh, we're about to start the, uh, the afternoon session here. Um, so um, uh, Hunter, if you could go ahead and start unmuting your participants, that would be great. Um, we, um, um, next up, the, the team to present is the, uh, the Spring Engineering and Electronic Dudes. I always have a hard time with their team name, but the S-E and E-D team. Um, and um, what the Spring Engineering and Electronic Dudes um, uh, project is about is attend to me. It is a system for doing uh, automated uh, attendance of classrooms so profs don't have to sit there and, um, you know, and call roll. So anyway, uh, if uh, you guys would take it away, um, tell us all about Attend to Me. Hi, one second. What? And I don't yet have video on you, Hunter. Do you know? I do see your screen, but uh, I don't see your video. And remember, we like to introduce people with, with their video cams. Uh, my thing says I have video. I, I see you, Hunter. Yeah, I can. I... <clears throat> All right. Hello, our project was Attend Me. Hi, I'm Hunter Allen, team lead, scrum master, and help set up the server. 
Uh, I'm Michael McCreary. I worked on the front end design of uh, the application as well as working on exporting the data to a CSV file. I'm Noah Broussard. I worked primarily on security and front end design. I'm Ross Prino. I mostly worked on a lot of the front end design and the logic behind a lot of it. I'm Theon Dick Doan. I'm the database architect and I worked a little bit on the security side as well. So our project name is AttendMe, which stands for Attendance Made Easy. The entire idea behind our project was to simplify and streamline the entire process of taking attendance for classes by providing an online format, which allows the students to check themselves in provided the proper circumstances, while also providing features, including viewing attendance records, exporting to a CSV for further documentation, and providing a clean view for students' schedules and current attendance records. With AttendMe using an online format for attendance, uh, this helps reduce any confusion that may arise when and keep a consistent format for attendance. So whenever at the beginning of class, a teacher may start calling out everyone's names to make sure that everyone's there or pass around a sheet to make sure everyone checks their name off and everything. Uh, that type of stuff would no longer need to happen. So it would keep up some class time. It wouldn't take any of that and also provide a much more simple format that everyone can understand and provided it's used in every class, it's also a very consistent format. So as long as you know how to do it once, you don't have to learn how exactly each teacher specifically wants the attendance taken. Um, it also provides additional features that I mentioned earlier and would lessen any teacher's time that would do that manually. So I'll hand it off to Hunter now. Hi, so AttendMe has lost features due to time constraints and money. To the original goal of attend me was that a student would it would automatically check a student's geolocation granted they gave permission uh, previously and then if they were within a certain geolocation uh, the classes geolocation at a certain time it would automatically check them in uh, we lost uh, automatic check-in because uh, we were not uh, allowed to do an app and uh, was asked to do a website and a website does not uh, unless the website is pulled up it doesn't allow you to get a user's uh, location automatically unless it's pulled up and so that's why we lost that and then we lost geolocation because we you to get a user's geolocation we have to be https secure uh, we were not able to get that. Uh, do we hosted ours on Tech's server, and the we would either have to pay, and we did not. Uh, we don't have a budget, so we weren't able to afford to get HTTPS or use the. There was a free certificate, but the certificate required connecting to our server, and you cannot connect to our server unless you're outside of Tech, unless you're inside Tech's. Uh, area because tech has a uh, wall, firewalls blocking outside users from accessing it. So we were not able to use that free service. So this presentation will go through a demo of the website testing and our profiler. Then we'll talk about security, security improvements, practices, impacts, and what was learned. So I will take us through the demo. So here we see we are at uh, Tennis Made Easy. We are using a VPN to be inside text network. So that's why we're able to access it. And so as you can see, there's a simple login. So we'll sign up a new person. So um, we'll name this person Jack and then last name Hunt. And then we'll give them an email and a password. And we're going to say they are a teacher. And so we have some simple uh, validation to make sure the user's input is correct. So if we give a the password and confirm password doesn't match, it'll let us know. And every field is required. So if one isn't entered, it won't let you in. So we'll submit. Uh, sure, let's save the password. So now let's log in as Jack. So as you can see, Jack does not have any classes. Uh, whenever a teacher first gets here, they'll have to add their classes. Uh, in future iterations, we would like to uh, would have liked to connect to Boss, so maybe it all ported over. 
but that was not able to be done. So we can add a class. So let's say it's uh, CSC 406. It's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and we have it at 8 a.m. So we hit submit, and now we can see that the class has been added. We see a name, uh, the time of the class, and a code was generated. This code is what you give students, and the students will be able to in insert that later so that it uh, so that you can be added to that class. So uh, 43796, I'm going to make note of that and keep that in mind. So we can check mark a class and this allows us to check mark all or uncheck mark all boxes. But as seeing they only have one, we will only do the one. So let's archive it. So this is so that we can still access the, a teacher can access a role after the class is done. So as you can see, we can see the archive date, the name of the class and the role. No need to go to the role since there isn't one right now. And the same with unarchiving it. You can also delete the class, but we're gonna use this class. So we'll keep it for now. So we have a settings page that the teacher can input uh, change settings. So let's say uh, it's not, uh, we'll change from Jack to Hunter and all the settings work. I won't go through every single one of them, but you can even delete your account. So we'll confirm the changes. So now if we go to home, we see welcome Hunter Hunt, uh, interesting name. And so let's now log out. So if we try to go to the previous page, we'll still be able to access the page, but we won't be able to access the specific user's information. And we'll talk about that later in security. So now let's go to a teacher that's been established for a little while. So now this teacher has three classes. And like I said, you can toggle check marks for all of them. So you can archive multiple or delete multiple. And so now we can go to the role of this teacher. Uh, this class only has four students in it, a very small class. And X is the note that they were present and dashes present uh, the note that they were absent. So I'm gonna bring attention to Robert Downey. We can see that today they haven't checked in. So we'll keep that in mind. Uh, another thing is export to CSV. Uh, if you, uh, this downloads a CSV, which if you're not familiar with that, is basically an Excel, you can access it through Excel. And so now the user can download and print off the role if they want through, uh, the attendance. So if they want to have it in their hands. So now uh, let's go back again. Robert Downey has not checked in today. So we will log out and we will log in as a student. For the student page, it's very similar uh, but not exact. So we can see uh, a couple differences as if they've checked in for today for that class. Uh, and now it doesn't give them the class code, but let's say the teacher gives them the class code. Uh, 43796 was the one earlier. And so now we add that class, the one that we created, uh, CSC 406 at 8 a.m. So if we go to the role, it only shows the student, the current student. And again, not logged in, uh, checked in for today. Uh, and there's no archive classes because that's not needed for a student. So now uh, we have it set where whenever it hits class time at 3.30, which was about 10 minutes ago, and if it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which today is Friday, then we can check into the class from 3.30 till four o'clock. We have it set where you can only check in for the first 30 minutes. So now let's check into the class. As simple as that. Now we know we've checked in because we get a little check mark. And if we go to the role, we can now see that they have been allocated and been put into the role. And so you can even export to CSV if you want as a student.
the nice thing about this is the fact that uh, many times students came and check their own role. They have to consult with the teacher. This makes it where that is not necessary. So I will log out. And now the last thing I want to show is the ability to reset the password. Currently, you only need the email and then you put in the new password and confirm the new password. And it'll reset it. Uh, we were not able to get e emails sent out. And so right now, all that's required is the email and the new password. So if we go and try the old password, it won't let us log in. But now if we go and do the new password, we will. So that is it for the demo. Next, I will move on to testing. We did two types of testing. Uh, we did front end testing to uh, check that the front end uh, is how we want it. Uh, these are sunny day tests. And then the other one was web, our server stress testing, which I won't be showing for this time sake for this demo. So we have multiple tests and we can run them all at once, but we're just gonna run one. So what this does is pulls up the website and checks, does all the things I've programmed it to do. My hands are off, it's doing it all automatically. And it makes sure that it's doing these things. If it doesn't, if it runs into an error where it wants click, let's say the menu, but it, the menu isn't there, it's gonna run, throw an error at us. So that is an example of some of our testing. I will now hand it off to Doan to talk about everything. Don't. I think he's muted. I think he might have been disconnected. Uh, he yeah, he was... like disconnected or something. Oh, so wait, he's muted him again. Uh, I cannot see the users right now. So, oh, here. let's see if I can find him. Unless someone else is able to unmute him. My apologies there, there uh, Cam died on me. Um, so on the database side, we basically decided to use MySQL for the uh, for both the profiler and the uh, database. Uh, as you can see here is our database schema. Uh, the way that it was initially done was very inefficient. And through the use of our profiler, we were able to trim the fat per se, and I'll uh, show you a bit about that here. Uh, during uh, Hunter's presentation or uh, demo, the profiler was already running. So all I would have to do is turn it off and show profile. Uh, during that time, uh, the MySQL Workbench basically allows us to have a live kind of uh, view of our server load. So this is really, really uh, imperative, especially whenever we're doing testing on uh, or stress testing our server, seeing how many students can actually or how many students and teachers can use the, the service at the same time. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, we're going to jump over to one second. We're going to jump back over to uh, the security side of the PowerPoint. So for our security measures, we decided to uh, use Bcrypt since Bcrypt is uh, known to be a one-way kind of hashing method. It takes a lot of horsepower to actually uncrack a uh, Bcrypt2 hash. Uh, so we use Bcrypt2 to hash the password and all the important stuff on the client side. And then we store the password into our user uh, session on the database side. That way we can keep things secure. Mm -hmm. Same thing with our sessions. We try and keep the, uh, the sessions as soon as you log in, uh, session information from the uh, HTML page. That way every single HTML, uh, HTML page is in a way secure. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Michael and he's gonna talk a little bit more to you. Thank you, Mr. Dome. 
All right, so with more time and resources, obviously our application could have had more features. Um, as Hunter previously mentioned, due to time and developmental and financial constraints, we weren't able to really flesh out our vision. Uh, as mentioned, the first of these would be a more secure email to change password. Uh, as seen in the test, you can just go and type in someone's email and then just type in a new password. So in theory, if you were just to have someone's email, you could reset their password for them, which isn't the most secure thing. Uh, this would be implemented further by having it to where, like something that you would have now where it would email you specifically in your inbox of the email address that is associated with your account and you would go in there and redirect back to the website and you'd be able to reset it from there. Uh, as mentioned as well, the geolocation and the automation side of that, of being able to automatically check it was lost due to the HTTPS certification um, and the ability to not build from the ground up as a mobile app, but with more time and effort put into those <laughs> aspects, uh, the application could really be what the vision was originally intended for it. Lastly, as well, with the, uh, with the advantage of being an application, there could be a notification system implemented. Being a mobile application, it would be have to grant those permissions to notify the phone, but as Hunter mentioned before, when you're on a web page, you don't always have permissions to access locations or give notifications and things like that. And this notification system would aim to help professors and students communicate in a better way about certain things that happen in the class, say a student misses a test or a certain amount of days that the teacher starts to be concerned, whether it's out of necessity or if there's something going on in the student's personal life, this could help students for better or worse in that way, be held accountable for being in the class or not in the class. In terms of the local and global impact, this application could really break some new ground. Uh, as far as we've been able to tell with our research, there's not any other application that is aimed to do this in an academic setting. So if we were to implement it even just on text campus and have it be something that is associated with our university specifically with the university resources, it could be tested and seen to the accuracy and the streamlining efficiency of just making everything better in terms of taking attendance and not having to sit and go through Moodle or pass around a piece of paper and just having it all to be done at the my finger. Um, if all this was to be implemented, obviously it could be implemented on a larger scale across other colleges or any kind of environments, possibly even professional environments, things that you know require people to be in their office or being on time to their job, just any kind of application where people need to be held accountable and the accuracy of geolocation is something that is deemed necessary. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand off uh, this to Noah to finish up our presentation. Thanks. So we followed industry practices to the best of our abilities, uh, including Trello and GitHub. So we use Trello primarily to keep track of the stories. Um, we use a sprint backlog, in progress, code review, and done columns just to keep track of where each story was during a sprint. Um, as we worked further and further into this project, we gradually got better at pointing stories just through learning the different tools we were using and learning the languages we were using. Um, that helped us pace our sprints a little bit better. For sprints one through three, we use GitHub to back up our progress and it allowed us to mark, merge our work seamlessly, um, as well as maintaining a backup. That is the advantage of version control. But after sprint three, we had to change up our methods a little bit due to the project only being available on campus or uh, through the virtual machine. So we had to decide between only one person at a time working on the virtual machine or working offsite and then getting together at some point later on and pushing all of our changes through the VM to GitHub. Um, we decided on that latter option just so that everybody could work simultaneously on their own projects. And then at the end, we would all push our stuff together and that just helped productivity. So for the next slide. We learned many different things, the most notable being server-side scripting, setting up a server, best practices, and how to adjust quickly. So just to briefly touch on these points, we learned and implemented PHP and SQL queries in order to connect our front-end web pages to our server and add functionality. Um, we met three times a week to have our team stand-ups. We met these times during class time, um, so we didn't want to just say we didn't have class, so let's not do anything. We use those times to meet up. And those standups obviously were just us saying what we had gotten done, what we were working on at the moment, and then any issues we might encounter. And we used those times so that we could all kind of help each other. Um, and then if we needed any help down the line, we would get together like one-on-one -on -one and do some code pairing. Um, 
<clears throat> we set up our server from scratch specifically for our website. The personalization maximized our personal productivity because we knew everything about the server. We knew how it all worked um, while also helping our server run more efficiently because we didn't have any bloat with it. One of our team's strengths was the ability to quickly adjust to any issues we come across through problem solving. Um, that really came in handy when about halfway through the project, we suddenly couldn't meet up in person anymore. Uh, we still managed to maintain our work ethic and productivity, and we completed our project in the given time frame. So that concludes our presentation, and now we'll open up the floor to any questions. Okay, thank you guys. Um, let me see if I can't bring this up. Okay. So, um, so the various questions um, is uh, a number of them were about how, how robust it's a system. So for example, questions like, can I bring my roommate's phone and check him in? Uh, is it possible to log in multiple people from the same device? Is there any kind of protection for that? So Could you guys address these questions? Yes, yeah, so uh, that was a valid concern that we thought of at the very beginning too. And currently there's nothing set up that prevents that. But if given more time, we planned on address, uh, log, uh, locking a phone, uh, a phone's MAC address or computer's MAC address to an account so that it checks the, currently uh, if they try to log in, checks the uh, phone's MAC address and if it's correct, then it lets them log in and then check in. But if not, then uh, they wouldn't be able to log in, which would prevent that. But the um, problem with that would be if a f user needed to log in through a new way, uh, through a new device. So it would, we would then put it on uh, the teacher side to be able to change it, basically. Like they would, the student would send a request like, hey, I wanna change uh, my device and it would just the teacher would say yes or no and uh, that would help prevent that. We also didn't get around to it because we kind of put it on a lower priority because we <laughs> realized that you could easily just spoof a MAC address and then you could easily you know pretend like you're someone else's phone so we had that on a lower priority and due to the time restraints and you know all the coronavirus stuff going on we just weren't able to get around to that feature. Yeah, and so um, if I could address, I, I heard something about uh, asking what's stopping people from like taking their roommate's phones or just going in with there, and that's a legitimate concern of security. But let's apply some human practicality. Are you you're just gonna let somebody take your phone for an hour and a half and just sit there without it? I mean, the, when you think about it, it just doesn't make sense on a personal level. Like, I just I don't know anyone who would do that. I mean, like, granted, is is still a legitimate concern, but in terms of like priority, it's just like. That yeah, I think that would realistically happen a lot. Yeah, and unfortunately, no matter what way is trying to be implemented, whether it's a sheet of paper or our uh, website, there's always going to be ways around it for people who try hard enough. It's mainly supposed to be a deterrent. Uh, right now, if a piece of paper is uh, handed out, anyone could just sign other people's mm -hmm. name, and there's nothing stopping that. Versus this, you got to take a couple extra steps, and so it deters people. Well, well, one way of stopping that is uh, professors who uh, who count the number of names again gets handed in and then counts the number of people in the class. Uh, I find that that works fairly effectively for me, and I've used that on many occasions. Yes, someone could come to the class and sit there for the entire two hours and sign someone else's name. I, it would probably cost you more than a six pack to get them to do that for you. Yeah. Um, and with that, like, we are trying to ease it off the teacher so that you don't have to do stuff like that because not every teacher is going to be doing that. And that's at a teacher's discretion. That's very effective, uh, what you're saying. So, uh, so just to be clear, there was a question. I think you guys have answered it. There is no geolocation right now. In Unfortunately yeah. not. We worked really hard to try to get that, but because of the fact that we couldn't get HTTPS secure um, and weren't, we weren't able to get that. I believe that if we would have got the security uh, certificate, then we would have been able to implement that in 30 minutes. 
Yeah, it was, and it was something that was like a consistent, like we didn't just try and do it once and then just say, oh, we give up. Like Hunter really, Hunter specifically, I'll say, really was going after trying to get that certification and it, it really just sadly just didn't play out. Yeah, if we were able to like have funding and be able to do it off on, on a server that's not techs, um, then it would be no problem. No, that, that's cool. We all realized that we were working under a lot, a lot of constraints this quarter that normally wouldn't be there. It, it's it's cool, but I'm just asking the questions. Yeah. Yes. Up. Um, can you can you do this allow late check in? A late late check in, yeah. So, like I kind of briefly mentioned, it lets you check in up till 30 minutes after class started and ideally if uh the whole point of scrum is to do a minimal viable product and then add more features we uh that'd be a cool feature where a teacher can add how late they want the a student to be able to check in but right now we just have it hard coded at 30 minutes but like some teachers might be like all right only five minutes after classes start or some might do the whole class time as as the as the database guy, uh, currently it it is implemented where it actually tracks it uh, your login time down to the minute. The only thing is we just didn't implement the uh, the showing of when a person has has been actually checked in. It only just shows true or false at this current time. And if uh, if a teacher wanted to check someone in manually, they can. If they're the type of person who exports it to a CSV for just keeping their own records, um, they can always just change it in the CSV if they want to do that. But we also were planning on having a, uh, a feature where a teacher could just change it in the website. However, once again, due to time constraints and all the difficulty with coronavirus and trying to get other stuff working, namely HTTPS, we weren't able to have enough time to implement that. to unmute myself and I do have one final question does the password reset not require a confirmation email or or any kind of second factor yeah, does that no. mean that anyone can reset anyone's password with uh, just an email yeah, yeah. I, I addressed that um, a little bit with the uh, more flesh out of the implementation that, that would just be implementing that functionality of it yeah there's uh, different services that uh, let you send emails, uh, but m most of them, if not every one of them, cost money. Um, so if we were to have funding, again, be able to uh, afford those services and send out the emails to be able to do a more secure reset password. And uh, I know I said that was the last question, but there was one final suggestion that said, uh, um, Maybe your uh, tool should have reporting to the teacher showing mm -hmm. like timestamps, device names, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And at least that might make it a little bit easier to figure out if uh, people are trying to game the system. Yeah. Of course, if point. there are five people sitting in the class and 20 and 25 people yeah. check in, you know that something's amiss, but yes. um, yeah. that might be, uh, that might be helpful. And Don did touch on that a little bit, how our server does track the time. We just don't have any way to export it at the moment. Um, so it would be a fairly simple addition to the project. Okay, well, uh, well, thank you guys. Uh, and, uh, and also thank you for remembering to turn off screen share <laughs> in your presentation so we could see your faces as you talked. Um, everybody, let's give a, a, a virtual round of virtual applause to um, to the Attend Me uh, Spring you. Engineering and Electronic Dudes team. We appreciate it. Um, we're right at two, so we're right on schedule. Um, next up, we have um, the Untitled Group. And yes, that's the name <laughs> of the group. The group is Untitled, uh, which is pretty funny. Uh, and uh, their application is uh, Stargazer. And uh, so Untitled Group, why don't you tell us about the Stargazer app? Hey, uh, my name is Alex Foshe. I worked a lot from uh, the front and back end of it. I basically worked as a full stack developer. Um, Amar? <laughs> Hey, my name is Amar, and I worked as a front-end developer as well. I kind of worked on the UI layout of the website and making the appearance of the website look nice. 
My name is Jason Miles. I worked mostly on the API and connecting the API to the front end and kind of designing the front end later on in the sprints. My name is Jonah Landry. I work with Jason on a lot of the APIs and then I uh, also continue to work on profiling the system and also more back end work with uh, Alex. Uh, my name is John Chung. I worked on the front end with Amara Saji. Uh, this is a presentation. All right. Okay, so Stargazer is our website. And so what we're going to go over today is the initial vision of our product, um, the current state it's in, tools that were used in making this product, some features that were implemented, the security, final polishing touches, the demo, lessons learned, and finally the conclusion. So the original vision of our product was to create a Stargazer app that was based in Rustin. And so essentially what this would do was it would forecast the current night sky and the future night sky. And so we also wanted to implement a physical live camera that was mounted on the IASB. And so this camera would look at the night sky and it would be a 24 seven live feed where users could join anytime they wanted to and access this and view this live feed. And in addition to that, these users would be able to capture selected images and upload them to a gallery of like say special events that happen during the night and other users would be able to view this image gallery and see what, what selected users have up uploaded. So that was kind of the original idea for our website. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one back, Alex. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so due to current circumstances and the COVID-19, um, implementing all these features has proven to be somewhat difficult. So initially, the live feed did not really work out because we were provided with a camera that was of low quality. And this camera was of low quality because it was meant to be attached to a telescope. And this telescope would look at the night sky and that's what would give us a clear image for the, for, for the night sky. However, um, getting a telescope proved to be quite expensive and also getting in contact with people to order the telescope during the whole COVID situation was also very difficult. So ultimately we decided to scrap the live feed idea um, just because we didn't have the resources to carry forward with it. And um, so seeing that we scrapped the live feed idea, we decided to transition our website into more of a social media kind of website. So we would still have the image gallery and users would still be able to upload pictures. However, it wouldn't be pictures that were captured off our live feed page. So it was kind of like a, a social astronomy um, website for, for astronomy users, essentially. Okay, so once we had our initial idea down, we decided to move into our planning phase. And to do so, we wanted to use the best means of technology that could um, promote our communication and collaboration. So what we decided to go with was Trello, GitHub, and Discord. And so for, for the Trello board, we essentially assigned tasks for everybody to pick up and do. Um, and the tasks were organized in a user story format. So essentially, it was played out where a user would come in and use our website. And then us as developers would have to go in and create the functionality for this user story to be carried out. And that's kind of how our Trello board was set up. And next we had our GitHub, which definitely made it easier for us to control and uh, manage all the updates and all the changes and track who did what and what changes went where. And it kept us more organized and on the same path. Um, and finally, I'd say our, our primary means of communication was Discord. Um, here's a picture of our, all our sub-channels that we had on our Discord and just any comments, concerns, questions, any, any information that we had regarding our project were posted there and I, everybody was pretty active on the on Discord. Communication was pretty, pretty fluid. And so, yeah, that was kind of the, the, the planning phase for our Stargazer website. Now I'm going to hand it over to Alex for website design. All right, so we initially designed the website with just HTML and CSS designed and whatnot and so because we really didn't have any idea on how to do web development at the moment at that time so starting uh, we started looking into like web frameworks and stuff and what we came across was flask uh, it's a micro web framework that uses Python 3 and it makes communication between backend and front end much more seamless than having to develop your own server and your own client and having them communicate consistently. Uh, how Flask uh, works is that uh, it's basically, it, it entails basically all, 
everything from the database to like the logic to the web page is basically all of this is, is defined within the flask framework um the database uh was mainly written in mysql lights uh well not mysql but sql light for locally locally and that's how we started off with but the problem was if we wanted to deploy it online for example heroku which is we do what you chose we needed a scalable more robust uh database and so we decided to use postgres sql and that how is how the database and then the templates use something called ginger 2 which had a python similar syntax to where it just implements logic within the web pages uh for instance you can like do variables, you can have parent templates, you can extend it and whatnot. Uh, we also implemented something called Blueprint uh, within our Flask application. And how that works is that it is supposed to help support scalability, where uh, each little, each little uh, folder, pretty much each directory has its own function. Like for instance, we have an authentication uh, folder and each one of those is supposed to be able to uh, Low, like communicate with each other locally other than having to rely on a global app. Uh, so it is supposed to like make things run faster, uh, communicate with each other more efficiently, and also just make it more organized for whenever you want to add new features. Uh, it's not just all a big jumble. And then website features that we've decided to implement or we ended up implementing is an image gallery where uh, users can upload and see other people uploads and you can like and dislike uh, images. Uh, we got weather information, ISS information, we got a web camera video feed. So we completely scrapped the idea of a remote camera. And so in place of the live feed tab, we uh, just decided to have it just display the web camera on you. And it, it doesn't show anyone else. It's just a just your instance of the website. It just displays right back to you. Uh, it's a it more of like a browser. It's more browser code than uh, anything else behind it. Uh, then we got user management system. Uh, this, you know, user login, user logout, uh, all that fancy stuff. We got social media sharing and contact us. We. The social media sharing was like one of the very last things and it's basically a little tab to the left where you can like share the current web page to like Facebook, Twitter, whatever. All right, so the first one was image gallery. So this one, users, users can upload and it would uh, go into the image gallery where you, peop, other people can like and dislike it. Uh, but in order to like and dislike, you need to be logged in. Uh, but anybody can download images, anybody can uh, see what other people have uploaded, and the images stored are, are on a file system, not in the actual database. What's stored in the database is the link to that actual file that's in the file system. So it's just like a more, so they can load more quickly and, you know, do not put a ton of stuff in the database. All right, uh, now next up is Jason to talk about weather and ISS. All right, so we decided to go with the Dark Sky service as our API provider. And there's a couple of main reasons for this, but um, the first and foremost main reason is that Dark Sky provides us with the information relative to our project that API, other APIs do not provide us for free, such as moon phase visibility and cloud coverage, all of which are very important for like the stargazing, um, which was again, our original vision. Um, the API call returns, returns a standard JSON file format, which we uh, convert into dictionaries and parse for information that will be displayed to the users. And uh, one little thing to note is that Dark Sky has joined Apple, and uh, they're no longer accepting current. Um, they're no longer accepting new signups for API keys, so, and the current API keys will stop functioning after the end of the year. So that means that the weather information that we have in our application will actually um, no longer function after the end of this year. So that would be something that we would have to fix in the future. Um, the other main API that we used was Open Notify. And Open Notify is, uh, as well, as the name suggests, it's, um, it notifies whenever um, there are visible passes of the International Space Station from a geolocation. Um, and you, the geolocation is determined by like the specific like uh, latitude longitude coordinates that you give um 
And what I mean by visible is that it won't return us ISS passes that during the daytime, which we originally thought was something that it did return to us. But when we were actually looking through the results and we looked through the times, we realized that it was only returning us ISS passes for the nighttime because those are the ones that you can see through the sky. And next we have our user system, which Alex has touched on a bit already. Um, one of the things he touched on is that we have account management. Of, um, users can create accounts, edit details such as their email and password, change the password, change the email, as well as delete the account. And of course, we have like the basic login logout functionality that a user system has to have. Um, users can, as Alex has already mentioned, like, dislike, and remove likes on images in any of our on any of the images in our image database. And to do this, you have to be logged in. Um, liking an image will save it to the profile page, um, to your profile page, and you'll have like a, a gallery of like liked images that's like underneath your profile picture. And um, right below that is the image upload function, which you will see in the demo. It allows a system or it allows a user to pick a, an image from their file system and upload it to our database. And doing so will display their name as the owner of that image. Um, and to touch a little bit more on the profile picture, our profile picture is actually based on a third party service called Gravatar. And basically what that is, it's a site that allows you to like create an account with an email address and upload a um, upload a profile picture. And then it generates a unique URL for your email address. So any application that uses that URL will be returned the profile picture that you uploaded to the site. So if you sign up on Stargazer with an email that you have registered on Gravatar service, you will automatically have your Gravatar profile picture registered on our um, on our service as your profile picture. And if you do not have a Gravatar URL or a Gravatar account rather, um, you'll have a randomly generated geometric pattern as your default um, profile picture. And again, as Alex has mentioned, we have a set of like social media share buttons on the left that go to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or, or you can send um, or, or an email. It will just send a link to the current page that you're viewing on. And then next up, we have John, who will talk about security. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we'll now go over the security used for our product, uh, most of which is due to Heroku's inbuilt security system, which has DDoS mitigation. And we also were able to uh, obtain a free SSL a certificate for using the Heroku app uh, extension and not a custom domain, which we were opting to use, uh, but we decided not to. Uh, after that, we implemented the WorkSug security password hashing with the PVK DF2 algorithm, which basically takes your password, salts it with eight randomly generated characters, uh, runs through a certain number of iterations, hashed, and then finally, with the desired key length, uh, is added onto it, in which we use 256 bits for our algorithm. Uh, the reason why we use this is because the, the PBK DF2 algorithm can take, if used correctly, can take a, a very long time to crack, uh, even with brute force attacks. However, the only downside to using that is that it can be implemented with cheap parts, allowing brute force attacks to be done with a low budget PC or anything of the sort. Uh, next, we had Google servers, which were used as a uh, secure message center. We basically had two emails set up, uh, one for receiving and one for sending. Uh, the sending was made much more vulnerable because in order to send with an automatic, uh, automated script, we were required to not only, one, enable the ability for uh, insecure third-party apps to access our email, but we also had to disable capture requirements to access this email. Uh, for efficiency on our website, we used webpagetest.org to run multiple tests on our website. And this allowed us to see how important the image database uh, is and how much work it would be uh, needed. And as you can see on the images on the right, we ran a before test, which is the top, and a uh, after test, which is on the bottom of it. And as you can see there, it, it did not bode well for our before test. So we stripped images and we compressed them across the entire website and 
that it began to load much better. Therefore, we were able to acquire A rankings on our compressed images and compressed transfers. And from the graph below, you see that not only were our requests all, all over um, the website, mainly images, but the bytes used were also from images mainly. And we manually tested using the Selenium IDE just so that we could check our systems on the fly. And we mainly use this because most of our tests required logging in and automating logins with Selenium proved much easier. Uh, now, uh, Jonah will just demonstrate the live demo of our product. Go ahead and bring that up for me, Alex. So, for the demo, we're gonna create an account. Oh, there it goes. I was like, wait, it's not coming out. All right, so we're going to All right. Yep. So as you can see from the front page, we have access to the weather, which shows those all important dark sky provided information with the moon phase and the visibility. And then what we're going to do for the demo, though, what we're interested in doing is going to account and creating a new one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this account isn't created yet. So, well, Yep, it's not created yet, so we're just yep. going to create Head one. over to create, put in your name, last name, email, password, confirm your password, all that classic account making action. <laughs> sign up, and then you can sign right on in. So we have then from there, we're going to head over to images, since that's the majority of our user capabilities. You notice there's a couple images there already. We're going to like a few, dislike some. And then we're going to add an image of our own. So in order to do that, we're going to head to our profile. And at the bottom left, it's not the prettiest, but it's functional. We'll choose a file. Go ahead and upload that. And then you'll notice it shows up in your profile, as well as the image that we liked. And then we're going to head back to images. And it'll appear for us in the bottom. We'll go ahead and give that one a like and take away one of the likes we've already given. All right. The majority of our functionality, so we'll go ahead and take a look at our other pages. You'll notice the live feed, just uh, as we said before, it gives a view of so for uh, me, camera. there is for a slight me, issue with this yeah. at the moment issue. because you got. Oh, I'm trying. I'm trying to actually turn yeah. up. Yeah, here. There's an issue with the camera uh, being used already. But so uh, since I'm since I'm using my webcam for Zoom, it doesn't show up on here. So let me just reload it real quick. Allow. So if you allow it. It should just use it. Oh, there it goes. So it just shows your current, uh, your webcam, and it just like shows it on your current instance of the website, which is pretty nice. All right, and we'll do one more thing for the purpose of the demo, which will require us to go to the contact us page. We're gonna put in our name, last name, and email. And we just had a slight issue when we were uh, Uploading our image, uh, it turned red for some reason. And we'll send that over. Send it, and then, and then we can check in our really look at it. Okay. All right, so uh, doo -doo -doo. though it didn't. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it took it a little bit. All right, so I misspelled miss my last name, but yeah, there you go. All right. Um, then we also got that. If we go to Count settings. Yeah, and we're going to end it the only way you can end by deleting it. All right, from there we go right on back to the presentation. We go to the images, yeah. anonymous, and then we go to the about page, which just shows what our goal is. All right, so. All right. Now, for the lessons learned from this whole project, it's communication is key in development. We've had some, while we did use Discord a lot and it was super useful, during those first few sprints, we weren't as good about it as we became. And the difference between those first few sprints and the ones after was night and day. 
another thing we noticed is that initiative is key. We had a lot of issues in previous sprints where we just, people would wait too long to get their work done and they would result in a sort of sprint at the end of the sprint, which we did get better at towards the end. And then of course, we all learned how to develop a scalable web app with various technologies. Like, a, like we said at the start, barely any of us had any experience developing websites. So we all had to learn HTML, Flask, Bootstrap, and CSS to a lesser extent. And then that leaves us at the conclusion. In the end, it changed from an informative resource to a social media app targeted at astronomy hobbyists, uh, functioning with a Python backend, HTML frontend, and Flask keeping the two together. Questions? Stop sharing screen. Oh, yeah. The new share. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. So, um, so, so there did seem to be, to be quite, a, uh, quite, a, quite a change from where you guys started to what you guys ended up developing. And that's understandable. I sometimes do that. Um, what are your, what are your future plans um, for this application or do you guys have a future if we were to, if we were to keep going past the quarantine i like to actually look into getting the live feed really working with a capture as well and trying to maybe not totally recapture our original plan but at least implement parts of it with what we have now and making it to where a user could click capture image and then it would upload that image as one of theirs and then also implementing ability to comment on those images to further it as a social media platform. There, there was um, also something, oh, yeah, something to also consider when going forward with this app is that Dark Sky has been bought by Apple and we won't be able to use their API functionality, I believe at the end of this year. So we'd have to look into a new way to, to provide the forecast functionality of our website. And lastly, uh, to add to like basically the social media aspect, we already have a comments like so comments were kind of are kind of missing right now. Uh, we actually have that implemented in the back end, but we have yet to implement front end because we haven't had the time. Uh, that was actually kind of in development before the last sprint ended. So, um, so yeah, comments would have been added, uh, liking, disliking comments, and just more like feature uh, social features and stuff. Um, and then one so, other thing oh, go ahead no please go ahead okay. one other thing that we realized is when we were looking for APIs because originally it wasn't just going to be the ISS every API available in order to see like constellations that were out and uh, planets that were out all the ones that we could find cost a decent amount of money to get a key for like you need $200 to get a key for one of the ones we found and that really, really limited the space. So if we had more resources and more time, it would be more than ideal in order to be able to have that. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Mike, you're muted currently. Yeah, sorry. Could you also address concern that maybe people would, um, uh, you know, would, would, would be more inclined to use something like Discord just to talk amongst themselves? About what they like. What is it that really drives them to use your your application rather than, um, you know, just board and, and chat about astronomy? Centralization. By using just the one app, you'd have access to a forecast. You'd have access to, well, in the future, a live feed. You'd be able to upload images, which while you can do in Discord, you wouldn't have that same ability to get the information of you know, weather, cloud coverage, and all the predictions. It was just like, you, you'd be able to see other users, like what they've seen and whatnot, all that, like uploaded to like one central area. And then just like, it's sort of like a, uh, a Reddit, or I guess something like that. Not, not really, I guess not Reddit, but something like that, but for astronomy uh, type stuff specifically. And, uh, there's an audience for that. I mean, there's there's already stuff that's kind of implemented, but not exactly our way. And uh, that where people come and stuff, go to that website. So that kind of community is already exists. And it would, it, those are the people we'll be targeting too. 
Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, uh, the scalability question came up. Um, you know, what would you need to scale this? For example, how would the system or the UI behave if uh, millions of photos were uploaded? Can you address the scalability question? So the every photo would be stored on a file system. Uh, if millions of photos would be uh, obviously stored on the file system, and each photo will have its own link, and those links will be stored in the database. Uh, the because of the scalability of like Postgres, it's makes it has the ability to store about a million a million million links and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're currently just using the Heroku file system. We have also ran into an issue just using that. So in the future, we will be uh, actually implementing AWS as to for scalability in their file system, uh, more than just Heroku. And one thing I'd like to add on to that is that if we were to scale the project up to use to encompass like millions of users, we'd also have to scale up our plans for like the APIs. In addition to the fact that we'd have to find like a, a new other API entirely, because right now, um, with the dark sky API, you have 1,000 free calls a day, which obviously would not be enough um, for not be enough for like a project of that size. So we would definitely have to scale up our API plans. So here was an interesting question that came to us from the audience. Um, uh, the um, the audience member noticed that you had a link to uh, to ISS to notice when it was uh, making an overpass. Uh, the question was, was there any initiative to reach out to NASA in order to maybe chat function with the ISS? Uh, I do know personally that the astronauts do sometimes on their free time, um, you know, uh, uh, chat, you know, on various platforms like Reddit or whatever. So that was interesting. And uh, the, the, go, the comment goes on to say it might be kind of cool to get a real-time shot from the ISS down on your terrestrial location during its overpass which might be something else that you could get the astronauts um, to do. So was there, any, was there any communication with NASA or any thought about communicating with NASA? I there did. was a little bit of, oh, go, yeah. there was a little bit of thought about communicating with their APIs. They were one of the ones we first tried, but never crossed my mind to actually just talk to the people. I've looked at not NASA stuff and I was like, oh, I actually did one of the same thing because you know I was looking at their ISS feed and I was like, it would be cool to put that on the website, but never actually thought about contacting them. I didn't really, I didn't know we could actually get anything done. I mean, they're pretty big, so I didn't really, you know what, that would actually be a really good idea, though. That's a good idea. Okay, and uh, we have one final technical question. Did you use a flat file organization structure, or did you hash the files in a folder structure? I think this is about the photos. The photos? Um, I think we just did the flat one. It was just like all, just all of it's just in a folder. Uh, so we we would put like different directories per user if it, if it grows big enough. But right now it's just all in just one little folder where everything's uploaded to. But there's no hashing or anything like that to the photos. They are compressed though. But I mean that's the only kind of modification we have for the photos at the moment. Uh, oh, well, well, thanks, guys. Um, let's everybody give a, uh, a round of virtual applause and maybe even a, uh, a thumbs up um, to our Untitled group with their Stargazer app. Um, it's right at the bottom of the hour, so uh, we're going to proceed to our uh, next and final uh, presentation for the afternoon. Uh, the team is called Cybernauts, and uh, the title of their uh, presentation is Teaching Cybersecurity Through a Game. So, Cybernauts, if you guys will take it away, I will appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, hey, everybody. We are Team Cybernauts. I am Zachary Brasso, and I worked primarily on audio components as well as assisting with some bug fixes. I am unable to share my screen for the PowerPoint. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Robert, you should now be able to share your screen.
Uh, have you guys finished your uh, your introductions? Oh, uh, we were doing that. Sorry, I was trying. Do you all see the? Uh, sorry, thing? you 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 kind of you kind of popped in there, uh, but nor normally people introduce everybody on the team and then you share screen. So if you could unshare oh, for a sec, uh, and uh, and finish the introductions, that would. Be Okay. Sorry. Uh, hi, y'all. I'm Robert Brown. Um, are we saying what we worked on to right now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I worked on primarily C sharp scripting in the back end. Um, I worked on implementing core game mechanics and mini games, primarily the back end code on that stuff. Hi, I'm Rebecca Grantham. I did most of the lesson planning, dialogue, and some of the mini game and challenge designs. Hey, I'm Emily Rambola, and I worked on lesson planning and graphics of the game. Hi, my name is Chao Chun Yu, and I work on GUI and uh, background uh, programming, such as Minimap and... Uh, Shaquin, your, uh, your, your audio is way too low. I don't think anyone can hear you. Uh, okay, can you hear me right now? Much better, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm Chao Chun Yu, uh, aka Zhang, and I work on some GUI and back-end programming, such as minimap and player inter uh, interaction with object, and things uh, for Dr. Cherry can add as our faculty mentor. So when our group was thinking of ideas for our project, we tried to think of issues that we could address creatively. We ended up um, thinking back on our education and noticed there was a lack of cybersecurity topics introduced to us at a um, younger age, like through middle to high school. So what was our solution? Creating an interactive game that teaches cybersecurity concepts, concepts at about sixth through eighth grade levels uh, these concepts we, would be taught through the dialogue and reinforced through quizzes, challenges, and mini games in order to keep the students interested and active while learning. These, the concepts covered throughout the game were decided after being advised by various professors and industry professionals. So during our project, we initially started using GitHub for our source control. Uh, however, we quickly learned that GitHub and Unity don't play together super well because of some checksums Unity does. So we moved to Unity's uh, own source control, Unity Collab. We also used Unity's built-in tools for profiling and unit testing. So going with that, um, along with Unity, we use Visual Studio to do all of our c -sharp programming and writing the various scripts um, to tie them into Unity. And for project management, we used Trello because we were doing a agile um, workflow, specifically Scrum, and Trello was really good for that. Um, to create the levels and the world of the game, we use the Unity tile palette in conjunction with the tile map. Uh, the tile map offers a variety of brushes that use pre-made sprites to easily create and edit the ground, background, foreground, and climbable areas of the game. In the game, we use a dialogue or a dialogue manager to create all the different conversations as well as all the quests to tie together different parts of the game. And so in that picture, we have a screenshot of what the dialogue manager looks like. It allows us to create a nice graph or a tree of conversation nodes and very easily in them set the, the state of quest and other variables. Uh, the dialogue creator also uses Lua on the back end. Um, the Lua allows you to store variables for quest states, um, conversation states, and the likes. These are some of the aspects of our game that we'd like y'all to take note of while we're demoing the game. We plan to explain them more extensively during the demo though. Okay, and now I'm going to get the demonstration pulled open. How is the sound on that? Is it fine for y'all? It's good. Okay, make sure. So this is the main menu of the game. Um, I'm just going to click 
new game to start. And this brings us into level zero. Um, if you can see the dialogue or this NPC right here has a text bubble above his head. And that is kind of used to indicate that there's something to say and there's something going on. So I'm gonna click through this conversation right here and she's just introducing the game, um, telling us how to play and letting me set a name for myself. I'm gonna go with Champ. So what she's saying, um, I've used the arrow keys to move as most platformers are. But she's giving me this folder right here. I can look through and it's saying, we're gonna learn about password security, ethics, networks, and along the way use challenges and quizzes to reinforce it. All the while, this is kind of keeping track through Quest. So now that I've um, accepted my mission, I'm tasked with creating a password because obviously you have to have a really secure password to access your computers. So I'm gonna run over here to create my password. And to first, I'm gonna use a really bad password right here to show you how the, um, the game will check the strength of the password and give you feedback on it, saying it needs to be longer, um, uppercase characters, numbers, and special characters. Uh, so now I can use a more secure password to show that it accepts it. and make sure I don't type in my password wrong. And as you see there, once I type in a good password, um, it's accepted and I'm allowed to go on to level one and actually really start playing. So here on level one, I hop out and you see this NPC once again has a text bubble. So that means I need to talk to them. For the sake of time, I'll be summarizing dialogues and highlighting key points throughout the demo. So when we meet this teammate, he's experiencing some cyberbullying issues. The player has multiple options throughout our dialogue, and um, in this case, he chooses to help the player and we're able to see, or help the NPC, and we're able to see some of the messages he's been receiving. Um, so now the player is going to get to decide how the best way to help this um, teammate. Uh, now that I've helped the teammate, I'm tasked with go talking to the talking to the boss of the team. Um, but along the way, I kind of see this book. I'm going to pick it up, see what's in it. Um, it's filled with a list of looking like really common passwords. So uh, this might be useful later. But I'm going to go over to the boss now and see what he has to say. Pick up this coin along the way, because why not? When we're talking to the boss, the player decides to tell the boss about the cyberbullying they witness. The boss tells the player that this is the best um, reaction to witnessing cyberbullying, which is a key point we wanted to highlight to these younger students. After this, the boss starts discussing with our player the, um, some of the pros and cons of social media, pros being you're connected with family and friends, cons such as um, Many people think they can post whatever they want without having any real consequences. So now that I um, talked to the boss, kind of helped out my teammate, I'm tasked with go taking a quiz for this level. Um, at the end of each level, there is a quiz. It kind of goes over, goes over the concepts that we learned throughout the level. So I also want to show, there's a computer right here, but it requires a two-factor authentication card. I think we're all kind of familiar with that. Um, I'll show that off in later levels for the sake of time. So I'm gonna go over here to take the quiz. So the first question is what's cyberbullying? Um, A and C are not correct because cyberbullying is online persistent and D which just isn't within the realm of bullying. So the answer would definitely be see uh, repeated bullying. If someone's being bullied online, um, the other answers that are involved that he are here wouldn't resolve the problem. So the correct answer would be B, report the bullying to a trusted adult. A 
a bystander is someone who stands up, uh, uh, I'm sorry, someone who sees someone being bullied and does nothing to stop it. And signs that someone's a victim of cyberbullying. Um, so cyberbullying breaks down people's spirits eventually. So victims of cyberbullying would not be super social, happy, or confident. So the answer would be D. Awesome. Uh, we got all the questions correct on that quiz. And with that, we're allowed to move on to the next level. So I'm just gonna hop on over to the door over here. Now this level is uh, focusing on personal info and phishing. So I'm gonna run over to the boss over here to get started. So during this conversation, the boss is introducing our player to personally identifiable information, PII for short. Um, the boss also warns the player that this type of information is not something that should just be posted and shared on social media accounts. And we're going to highlight this a little later um, throughout this level. Okay. Um, now, what, to reinforce the idea of PII, the boss just tasked me with a challenge on the computer. It's a game that involves catching, what, catching info falling from the sky. But before I can access the computer, I have to um, find the two-factor authentication card. So I'm going to go and find that real quick. Okay, in the same time, I will introduce the inventory and the minimap. The inventory is the GUI that allows the player to interact with game object to use it to drop it and to collect it. And for minimap, it create another camera along the player side, which shows different thing in the minimap. Uh, for example, the question item will mark the MTC with, with the uh, quiz or the quest. Uh, it will push the game flow and the golden icon, it marks the MTC give uh, player quiz and other icon like box and will show the you know, collective items. So um, you may have been wondering why I was collecting the coins. I will show you in just a moment. This. As I have to type in my password first to get access to the computer. Oh, I typed something in wrong. A really strong password. Okay. okay. There we go. Um, oh, I guess I could, so the games actually require coins to, um, before you can access it. I collected too many coins by accident and I was able to access it still. But um, you have to collect at least three or four coins to get access to the game, but I'm gonna play it. And the purpose of this game, like we mentioned earlier, was to reinforce the topics of PII. So topics um, or information such as your home address and your full name, you might not want to just be revealing, but things like your favorite vacation, your favorite food, um, those aren't really information that are going to compromise your identity. And like I said, we just wanted to reinforce what type of information these younger students should be and should not be um, releasing online. So now that I um, got that game, got six points on it, which was required, I can go back to the boss and continue the conversation. And this conversation kind of stems off of the PII talk, but we started talking about phishing. Um, and we're just telling the player that phishing is, um, is when someone poses as a person who you should trust in order to gain information that could be exploited. And we're about to show our player how to avoid that. So to kind of reinforce the idea of phishing, um, the boss just tasked me with go helping our teammate find and delete phishing emails on their phone. So I'm gonna talk to the teammate real quick to start that. And so the teammate's just saying they're having issues with phishing emails. I can pick up their phone, open this email app right here and look through it and they may look the same, but some of these are phishing emails, some of them are normal. And I can click on the phishing emails right here. It kind of increments the counter in the corner. 
then once I find enough, I can talk back to my teammate and he thanks us and sends us back to the boss to complete this mission or quest. Right over there real quick. And so now that I just finished the quest um, and my objectives, I'm sent to go take another quiz. Uh, this time the quiz is on PII and personal info, phishing, that sort of things. And on the way over, I'm gonna pick up this item right here. Um, this is an example of an appendix like we talked about uh, at the beginning. Um, at each level, there's an appendix. It has a bunch of extra info. Like this will get, goes into more detail about examples of PII and non-PII information and why we need to be careful of phishing. But let me go to Jill right here and take the quiz. So the example of a standalone PII, it would be full name. Um, what kind of information do fishers look for? They mainly look for the personal and private identif uh, private information. What is a way to avoid having your information fished is to make sure you know who you're talking to before you're sharing anything online. And lastly, what is some information you should avoid sharing on social media is home address. The rest of the answers are incorrect because it doesn't show anything that's super personal or identifiable. Okay, cool. I just got, well, I just got the questions right on that quiz. So now it's saying I can move on to level three and continue the missions. Uh, this level focuses on networking and sort of how networks work. So I'm going to go right here. He has a bubble telling me there's something to talk to him about. So right now the boss is um, introducing our player to the main components of a computer network. Like we mentioned before, the appendix is available for the player um, with more in-depth information. So this appendix um, contains the purpose for each um, each network component and will end up helping our player a lot more. Okay, so um, it wants me to talk to my teammate, but before I do that, I'm gonna show some mini games we have on the computer. And before I do that, I have to collect some coins and find my 2FA card. But Zach will tell you about some sounds in the meantime. So all the music and sound effects that you've been hearing throughout uh, were composed and designed specifically for this project. Um, the sound effects were made specific uh, from different uh, samples that I've collected with some processing over them. And all the music was composed in MIDI and then sent through a digital synthesizer so we could get actual sound. Um, in order to keep with the aesthetic style of the game, uh, the music was composed in a way similar to that of traditional 8-bit games. So you have five channels, one for drums, and then four for other miscellaneous things like melody, chords, and bass. Uh, so you don't get all this very super complex sound, but you get something nice and fun. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than traditional games, but overall, I personally feel like it fits the mood. So I want to show how the computer requires coins, so I did not collect all of them on this level. Um, I just have to first type in my password. Hopefully I'll get it right this time. Okay, so if I try to click on one, I guess it was three coins, my bad. Well, if I had not collected three coins, it would have asked me to collect more coins. Uh, but this uh, game right here is a mini game, uh, it's a word search. Uh, the word search is based off of that list of really bad passwords I showed you earlier. And it's just kind of randomly generated every time you start it. So I can try to find some of these words, but I'm not sure how well I would do. Um, I just wanted to show the how the game works. Oh, I guess that was not a word. Well, I'm not gonna sit there and try to find a bunch of words. I'm not too good at that. Oh, we also have a crossword. Uh, this crossword game is composed of, um, built with just a bunch of various cybersecurity terms. So I'm gonna go right here and play it. Oops, looks like we had played it before. Um, but I can go over to example right here. My bad number six uh, across, six across uh, being harassed or threatened online. 
That is cyberbullying. Oh, I just typed that one. Got that one typed in. Um, for example, there's also, let's look at number one down. Security systems used to stop unauthorized access. That would be a firewall. Um, what else do we have that I know off the top of my head? A 13 across um, activity defrauding on an account holder. That is phishing. That was from this one. I'm not going to go into that game too much, but that is the capability of the game. And I accidentally started dialogue with the boss again when I left the computer. My bad. But so now I need to go talk to my team member to finish that quest and conversation tree. Uh, during this dialogue, we're talking about traffic flow and control of a network. But I'm going to talk about some other stuff we added in our dialogue. We have optional lessons throughout um, throughout our levels under the direction of our faculty men mentor, Dr. Cherry. Originally, we had very long dialogues, and you had to keep clicking back and forth. So now we just have optional lessons for the player in case they get stuck on quizzes or challenges. Um, these optional lessons, they're uh, tied to like random workers, sort of NPCs throughout the levels. and. Uh, we didn't have time to really show it all off, but you can talk to them throughout the levels. Um, this is another one of the appendices that we have throughout the levels. This one just talking more about networks and the different components of a network that are considered important. But I'm going to move on to the last ass assessment for this level, which is another quiz. All right, so let's take it. So this is a final quiz. It's what should you do if you witness cyberbullying or bullying in general? You're going to want to report it to a trusted adult. What's an example of some personally identifiable information? And that's going to be your full name. What's a bystander? Uh, it's going to be someone who sees someone being bullied and does nothing to stop it. And then what are some characteristics of a good password? It's going to be all of the above. Okay, so I got all of those correct right there. And it's now saying I can kind of go through the door and finish the game. Um, when I exit the game, it's going to bring me back to the main menu. That's kind of um, what we have right now. So uh, that is our demonstration. Thank you for watching it. Okay, that was very interesting. Are you guys ready for questions? Yes. We got quite a few comments and questions while y'all were talking. Um, the first comment was uh, was made that was that uh, hey, this looks more interesting than the annual cyber awareness training required across the Department of Defense. Is that <laughs> what? All you, by all you, idea, kind of. Uh, Make cyber training more interesting. Like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing crosstalk. Oh. Um, that's so yes, yeah, so uh, they were they were they were uh, giving you a, a lot of praise for that. I would also say that it looks more engaging than the uh, training modules uh, us faculty members have to take um, from the state of Louisiana. We it's not specifically cyber defense, but it's the same kind of things, bullying and stuff like that. So, made a good impression. Um, related to that, though, um, we have a, a, a question. Uh, how would you measure the effectiveness of this as an educational tool? Uh, the speaker said that um, he wanted to note that uh, it's a it's a great it's a neat two D platformer on its own, but looking past the gameplay, is it a good educational tool? Uh, and also, so not only how do you how do you measure the effectiveness, is there a way to export progress through the game so that organizations such as schools and businesses could have a record of it? For example, when we go through these kind of training exercises, you know, you get interrupted, you need to be able to come back, there needs to be a record, and uh, there, there especially needs to be a record so the state can prove that all of its employees went through the training. So how would you address the effectiveness of it as an educational tool and this question of some progress? I think I can sort of speak on that one. Some of the people who helped advise us were from the Cyber Innovation Center, and they are, um, they create a lot of cybersecurity curriculums for the state of Louisiana, and they've mostly been focusing on Bossier Parish so far where they're testing it. 
I think the best way that this game could be implemented would be tied along with a curriculum plan. Um, and so it's being taught by teachers and I think Dr. O'Neill might have froze, but it's being taught by teachers and kind of the quizzes could be changed in our game to follow those curriculums a little better. And that could be the, that's better testing for the student than the challenges in mini games. The mini games and the challenges are more meant to just reinforce the concepts that have been mentioned throughout the dialogue. Um, Dr. O'Neill had mentioned, would it be possible to export the data to show progress? Mm -hmm. um, currently right now, all the data is just stored in a Lua um, backend database, kind of just as variables. However, it's, it's possible we could go in and write a function that would take all that Lua data and then export it to a CSV format or, some, or something. But currently, we do not have a way to export it. So uh, some gameplay questions. Uh, is the story completely linear, or are there any dynamic aspects? In other words, if I play it 10 times, will it be exactly the same each time? Um, is it linear? Uh, it's mostly linear currently. We wanted to have, uh, we have a few small dynamic things, like you can talk to other NPCs and play mini games, but for the most part, it's very linear currently. Related to that, what happens if you miss a question on the quiz? Uh, a number of people ask that question. Oh yeah, um, I should have showed that. If you miss a question on the quiz, it will have you, it'll tell you what you got wrong and then have you retake the quiz until you get them all right. Okay, that's a fairly standard approach to that. Um, one question about gameplay is how do you know who to talk to next or where to get the next quiz? Is there any kind of a, a map or a hint or how, how do you know what to do next? So that was the mini map that um, John had mentioned during I think level one he mentioned it and there's like a little question mark on the icons that kind of directs them where they should go or to the certain NPCs. Um, additionally, um, on top of or above each NPC, when they had dialogue or a quest available for the player, that was the only time there was a bubble box above them with text. Uh, that only appeared when there was something to talk about. A more technical question. Uh, how Approximately how many assets were created from scratch and how many were downloaded from the Unity Asset Store? Um, so all of our audio assets were created from scratch. I believe that's probably the better so. Um, and then I'm not sure about our tile map. Emily might have more on that. Um, the tile map and the NPCs were downloaded from the um, Unity Store. We just figured it would be a quicker way to get more function into the game as opposed to creating all of that stuff by ourselves. And uh, here's, here's another one. Uh, did you guys consider a simple text to speech engine uh, to give it a, to have the quizzes spoken? We did yeah. not consider that, but that's a really good thought. <laughs> That would have been something that would be great to implement. With There's probably something in Unity for that to make it right. fairly, but we'd never thought about it. And finally, I had a question I was just curious about. <clears throat> Did anyone in Cybernauts take either Dr. Berg's or um, game design class or, or my graphics class? Or uh, was this all completely self-taught um, by you guys? Very much self-taught. Luckily, we had Dr. Cherry who helped guide us a lot this quarter, and he does a lot with game design here at Tech. He was really great. We were meeting with him about every other week um, when we weren't doing our sprint retrospective um, videos to look at everyone else's progress, but um, he really helped guide us throughout the whole game process, I think. So. Yeah, Dr. Cherry teaches uh, a, a game class with Dr. Berg over uh, from the art department. So yeah, I was just I was just wondering about that. One one last question that just popped up. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on um, on how this could be adapted for uh, the visually impaired? Whenever you mentioned the question about the text to dot like speech 
that kind of made me think about that, but I don't think we had any ideas on that now, but I'm sure Unity, like Robert said, would have a tool that could give descriptions of each level and kind of help the player, guide the player through that, but I'm not exactly sure how that would work. It would be kind of hard since a lot of it does involve yeah. like looking at the screen and clicking on something, but um, we could make the dialogue and the quizzes themselves speech to text and kind of have like a streamlined and version. The reason why that's rather important is because um, organizations that are that are typically going to require this kind of, of training also have to be ADA Americans with Disability mm -hmm. Act compliant. And so there would at least have to be some option available for uh, people who are visually impaired. So, uh, but yes, I, I think everyone realizes it would be very difficult to take a visual game and, and, right. and, and adapt it. So um, are there any other uh, comments from you guys? If not, everybody let's give um, a round of applause, a round of virtual applause to, uh, to the cybernauts. Um, and, uh, and with that, that's the, the last uh, presentation that we had today. I would like to thank everybody for, uh, for attending this session. I think we all got to, uh, to see a lot of very, very interesting projects. Um, the Senior Design Conference is a great way for us to show off uh, the capabilities of our tech students. Uh, as, it's, as is apparent from these projects, a lot of work went into them. The students have been working on these things for the last six months or so. So um, there is a lot of time and effort that goes into it. Um, also too, um, I, I think that the, uh, the online version of the conference worked pretty good, uh, especially because this is the first time we've done this. So you know, tech triumphs over COVID-19, uh, yay, yay tech. Um, if you are a, uh, a student, um, I've put this in the general chat uh, multiple times, the CS490 students, please, please, please save your uh, answers on your, um, on your questionnaire before you hit submit because of all of the hundreds of little buttons that you have to fill in, if even one of them is left empty and you hit submit and haven't saved, all of the input will be wiped. So I certainly don't want that to happen to anyone. Um, so please remember to save before you hit submit. Um, additionally, um, for the board of uh, industry advisory board members, uh, you should uh, fill out a, a PDF for each of the teams that you were uh, evaluating. Those should be mailed to Dr. Boyd. Please check them and make sure that they're actually filled out because if you don't save them, they sometimes wipe what you put in. So <laughs> we, won't, we don't want John to get a whole bunch of <laughs> blank forms, uh, which has happened before. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to call the meeting to a close. Again, thank you all. We had, we had great participation. I noticed we're sitting at 41 participants right now, and we were up above 50 at one point. Really good turnout. Honestly, better turnout than we have when we do it live, I guess, because you don't have to worry about squeezing everybody into one room. So, um, so thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to everyone who came today. Uh, I really appreciate it. You guys have a great weekend. And I uh, hope to see many of you soon live in person. Take care. Bye-bye.